go. Well, we come to the part of the uh, Predators Pilgrim Weekend that's always just an awful lot of fun. Uh, as you already know, and if you didn't know it, then you probably discern there are some differing views among the different speakers on different things. That's one of the reasons that it gets to be some fun. And because we get to kind of get to go back and forth here, and some of the, uh, some of the questions are addressed to specific individuals. And somebody said they're all addressed to Don, actually about the first 40,000 of them are to William. But uh, we're going to intersperse some of them. So what we do on this, and we will ask each one of the speakers to do their very best to honor this, the speaker uh, who has been addressed by the, by the question, some of them are not addressed to any specific person, so I will ask the question. I may or may not comment it out. I may just pass it right on. But be that as it may, Anyone else on the panel here is more than welcome to address, to respond to it, but the comments, we've got to keep them brief because William, for instance, has got to leave no later than 11 o'clock because of his flight. So uh, we, we don't want to short circuit William and leave him out of some of the questions by any means. So with that said, the very first question, and by the way, I basically just kind of shuffled these uh, the order that I was given a stack, I just kind of shuffled them. I did not choose and say, okay I, okay, I like that question. I don't like that question. I didn't do that. Uh, we just, here they are. They're basically in the order that I received them. <clears throat> so, William, is the immortality that, that the Revelation Tree of Life provides different from the immortality provided by the Genesis Tree of Life was one physical? Um, and follow-up question, why was Yahweh seemingly only afraid that Adam would eat of the tree of life after he sinned? Why was it okay to eat of the tree of life before that, making one wonder if, if he had eaten of the tree of life, could he, could he even then eat of the other tree? Okay. All right, let me hold the question so I can... All right, so let's take the first question. Is the immortality that the Revelation Tree of Life provides different than the immortality provided by the Genesis Tree of Life? Was one physical? Uh, no, I don't think that one was physical. In, or if you're asking was the tree itself physical, I think the tree was physical, but I think the tree represented something that was spiritual, just like the tree that he ate of. If you look at uh, the text that says um, God planted all these trees, and then he says, and also there was the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So from that perspective, I do believe that it was a tree that represented a spiritual consequence uh, on both the positive side and on the negative side. So to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would result in a negative spiritual consequence. To eat of the tree of life would result in a spiritual consequence. Now, I do believe in Revelation that these, or rather these trees typified, uh, particularly the tree of life, typified a spiritual tree in the book of Revelation. So I don't think that's uh, uh, physical, but I think the, the objective behind them both was the same. I, and, and so that's my opinion on it. Um, and let's see, what else does it say? Is the immortality that the Revelation tree of life provides different? No, I don't think that the, uh, the immortality was any different. I mean, immortality to me, in terms of what the Bible says in Genesis 3.22, says to eat and live forever. I tried to make that clear from all of the statements that were spoken of in the Gospel of John, which I think John chapter 6, uh, 58 is probably one of the best uh, expressions of what the tree of life is all about. If you partake of Christ, you live forever. That's John 4 with the water of life and John 7. All of those statements to me are equivalent. And so I think it has been what it was from the beginning and is the same now. And, and all of these things, you know, when we're looking at the analogies that refer to Christ, uh, we have to understand that, you know, Christ can be the light or the lampstand. He can be the uh, the, the mercy seat, he can be any of these things, and we, we have to be careful not to um, uh, confuse them as they're being used, but they all have a, they all represent Christ in some, uh, in some manner. So I would uh, consider that my answer to the first part of the question. Uh, secondly, why was 
uh, Yah, seemingly only afraid Adam would eat of the tree of life after he sinned? Well, I think because uh, after he sinned, he was no longer privileged to do so. Uh, I don't think that it would have made him live forever on earth in sin, as someone has suggested. I don't think that's what was involved. I think the fact that he uh, 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 lost his privilege to access to it was that God was not going to allow him to do it in that state of sin to achieve the end goal of the tree of life. So with that, uh, that would be my answer. And then it says one more question. Why was it okay to eat of the tree of life before that, making one wonder if he had eaten of the tree of life, could he have even eaten of the other trees? Yes, I think he still would have been able to do that because the tree of life, in my understanding, was there for Adam's life to extend beyond his physical life. I think what God was doing was offering him an opportunity to participate in kingdom life, which he had not at that point chosen to do. And so that would be my answer. I like everything William said. I would like to challenge one concept, and that is uh, when we open the book of Genesis and we read about the tree of life and the, the serpent's temptation and all of that, um, and this gets to, I guess, my first lesson. If we were to open up any other ancient Near Eastern book and read about magical trees and talking serpents, we wouldn't take them literally. We wouldn't take them physically. So I have some serious doubts about there being a physical tree um, there, plus the tree in Revelation is not, so if there's a matchup there, it would seem to be representative of something else. And that's not anything to fight about, just a comment. We like comments. Okay, uh, the second question is, uh, can you give me a concise summary um, to show how we being in Christ's temple fits with first century saints meeting the Lord in the air and is coming to dwell uh, with them where they were. Concise? <laughs> did, did, have you seen my book, We Shall Meet Him in the Air, back there, 453 pages trying to explain this concisely? Wow. Okay. Uh, the, the imagery of meeting Christ in the air, as I try to explain in the book, is based upon the Greek word, uh, the technical term, apontesis. It doesn't simply mean to go out and meet and then go back where they were. It means to go out and uh, meet, come back to the destination city. The concept is the restoration of life, the, uh, the overcoming of Adamic death. It is temple, all right? So, num number one, uh, this, this all certainly has to do with meeting the Lord in there. And I, I would share with you the idea that the word air, Greek word air, uh, is the word that is used in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, we all walked according to the prince of the power of the air. Now, there was in both Roman, Greek, and Hebraic thought at the time that the evil forces uh, inhabited the air, not the air that we breathe, but in the spiritual dimension beyond visible sight. It's kind of like in the book of Kings, where, you know, Elisha is shut up in the city, and his servant is just, uh, you know, scared absolutely to death. Because we're going to die, we're going to die. Because they're, they're the enemies of God outside the gate. And Elisha prays the Lord. Lord, open his eyes. Lord opens his eyes. And Elisha asks him, what do you see? I see, I, well, I see the armies of the Lord. Well, they were always there. But that's in the spiritual dimension. So uh, in, in Hebraic thought, in Roman thought, in Greece, Greek and Grecian thought at the time, there was the idea that there is a spiritual dimension beyond human sight and that the conflict between good and evil played out there. Now, when you compare that with Paul's statement in Ephesians chapter 2, same context as all air, he has raised us up and made us to sit together with him in heavenly places. Well, the heavenly places is obviously a spiritual realm. He hadn't made them to sit on physical thrones on earth. If you would have looked at the, at, at the Ephesians from a outward physical perspective, you would have said that's the biggest bunch of losers in the world because they're a bunch of slaves and outcasts and they're persecuted, et cetera, et cetera. But they had been raised up together to be seated with Christ in the, in the heavenly realms. By the way, he goes ahead to say in Ephesians chapter 6, our warfare is not carnal. We do not fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the heavenly realm. The heavenly realm is the air. 
Christ coming and meeting them in the air is a statement of Christ's triumph over the spiritual wickedness in high places. And the restoration of the temple of God bringing Israel's salvation history to its close so that the nations may enjoy the benefit of Israel's consummated salvation. That's as concise as I'm going to get it. I'd like to add a thought on the word rapture in that verse, or caught up. It's the, uh, uh, a Greek word which, uh, from which we might get the word rape, for example, to snatch or to seize away, to take uh, by force from somebody else. And it's used also, uh, in an intensified form of it is used also in Matthew 12, where Jesus is uh, accused of casting out uh, Satan. And he, he says in verse 28, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds a strong man, then he will plunder his house. That word plunder is the same word. It's the plundering. And <clears throat> Sam, this one's for you. That reminds me of what was said in Isaiah. <laughs> um, and let me turn there quickly. Yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you, David. In, in I, uh, Isaiah 53, and verse 12, I will allot him a portion with the great, he will divide the booty with the strong. Jesus in Matthew 12 said he would plunder the possession of the strong. Isaiah said that he would divide the booty with the strong. This word of snatching away, uh, going to be snatched away from Satan's possession into the possession of Messiah. So that would be my addition to Don's concise comments. All right. Um, I think this is a, a generic question to each one of us. How can we know what teachings and practices before AD 70 carry over to us today? Uh, I would just simply comment very, very quickly, and then I'll pass the baton on. In Romans chapter 13, and Romans chapter 13 to a great extent is parallel to Galatians 3, or excuse me, Galatians 5, 19 and following, where Paul discusses the works of the flesh, which are manifest, which are these, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But Paul says, and now knowing the time, that it, it is high time that you awaken out of your sleep. Uh, for, you know, it, the day of the Lord was at hand. And he said, let us walk honestly. Now notice the little term. As in the day. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Saturday morning to you. And welcome back to Preterist Pilgrim Weekend 2020. Here we are, last day of the seminar. Uh, the last three presentations. Uh, what we have for you today is we have John Watson's uh, second and last speech. We have William Bell uh, on tap. And then we have my final presentation as well. Uh, I just have to take a moment to express my appreciation to each of the speakers for the fantastic work that they have done, the great lessons that they have prepared. And, you know, look, uh, it, it's, uh, as I've said before, it takes a lot of time, takes a lot of preparation, takes a lot of study and research to be able to put together a 40, 45 minute presentation uh, to try to make it organized, try to make it coherent, try to make it powerful, try to make it convincing. And so uh, we have seen some and witnessed some great lessons. We really, really appreciate that. Now, John Watson is going to give us his second lesson on the book of Revelation. He has shared with us the identity of Babylon. Now he's going to carry that forward, and he's going to be talking to us about the application of it. What does it mean based upon that identification? Now, this is an important lesson. You certainly want to pay attention. We appreciate John's effort. We appreciate what uh, John has gone through in his ministry, what he stands for, his courage and conviction, and his integrity. So, once again, here's John Watson. Hello, everybody. Welcome to PPW 2020. My name is John Watson. I am the preacher at the West Side Church of Christ in Indianapolis, Indiana. I consider it a privilege and an honor to be able to be here with you all 
today and speak to you about the things of the, of the Lord. And these things that we'll be considering today without question prove that he is who he's claimed to be. And that's something that can't be changed. And these prophecies are just as powerful today in their fulfillment as they were nearly 2,000 years ago. Before we get started with that, I want to, uh, to say thank you very much to Don for, for allowing me this opportunity. I think it's a good thing that, uh, that we can get together and talk about these things and consider them and study them and, and present ideas. This is uh, much more than ideas, actually. This is gospel, by the way. This is a part of that, as I mentioned just a moment ago. The gospel is about proving who Jesus was and what he stood for and what he accomplished and the victory that we have in him, even yet this day that began in the first century. So those things that we're, we're talking about today, uh, we, we just don't take them lightheartedly. And I certainly don't. Anytime I have that opportunity to be able to speak to a group, I'm going to take it and I'm going to uh, make the most of it that I can to reach the lost. And that's really all prophecy is about. Remember, Revelation 19 and verse 10 teaches that very concept that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So we can't ignore that. Let's begin talking about uh, our subject here this, uh, this morning. And this is from Revelation chapter 20. And we start in about verse 7. But before we do that, I want to read something that uh, just kind of a prepared statement. It, it helps me to do this and to define what we're going to be doing. So here it is. Here you go. For what, for what it's worth. The war, we'll put that in quotes. The war is, um, of, uh, let's try this again. Okay, so the war of Revelation 16, 14, 19, 19, and chapter 20, verse 8 was for a specific purpose. It is singular and specific in its nature. It's a one and done deal. Gog is used to illustrate the war, its purpose, duration, and timing. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what the war is, when it came to an end, and what Gog and Magog represents and how it helps us to understand that. So let's just jump right into this. So in verse 7 of chapter 20 of Revelation, we read, When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. Now, the way my brain works, I don't know how you all see this, but, but uh, the way my brain works is, is he says the when the thousand years are completed. Well, I'm not going to read just one little part of, of a passage or verse and half of it at that and then try to formulate an entire theology based on that. I want to look at the whole context, and I think that's just responsible uh, exegesis, that's just being a re responsible Bible student. And that's what uh, all of us are. We're, if we're concerned about what God has to say about things, we are Bible students. It doesn't matter where we're at or what stage we're at in our learning. So that's what we have to do. So he says that, that the thousand years are going to be completed. So it's not, obviously it's not an open-ended thing. So let's just read on here. And he says, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. So at the time the thousand years is completed, Satan's released. The nations come out from the four corners of the earth. You've got Gog and Magog to gather together for the war. And he says the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they come upon the broad plain of the earth, surrounded by the camp of the saints of the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So, so that's essentially where we're concerned. What we're concerned with here today. But my focus goes to this idea of a thousand years being completed. Now, here's what this idea of being completed means. We often think, oh well, it's when things are done. No, no, no. This is the process. Here's the definition, according to Strong's. It's the word uh, teleo or teleo. And the definition is to bring to an end or complete or fulfill. So we see that idea of a process there. And you might say, well, I don't see it. I do. <laughs> because Thayer says this. Thayer says to bring to a close, to finish, to end. Uh, in the passive, it's past, finished. Revelation 20, he quotes uh, or suggests 3, 5, and 7. In helps word studies from BibleHub.com. They say it's a cognate from 5055 to Leo. It's from 5056, which we're very familiar with this idea of telos. It means consummation or com 
completion, aim, goal. And they go on to say properly to complete or consummate, i.e. finish qualitatively, the necessary process with the results rolling over to the next level or phase of consummation. And we see that as a scriptural concept without question. So when we look at it from that standpoint, we can see that this is a process. This isn't, well, at the end, then all this stuff happens. This is during this process and in its, in its uh, fulfillment as it's coming to its aim or its goal. They go on to explain it like this. And I think that this is actually pretty decent. At least I'll explain it how I see it. This root, tell, means reaching the end or aim. It is well illustrated with the old pirate's telescope unfolding or extending out one stage at a time to function at full strength or capacity or effectiveness. And here's the way I see that. We see these things in, this, in the process, and then when it's all done, it's reached its goal, it's aim, and then we're seeing things clearly, just like in that telescope, right? So it's not until it's all finished and all completed that we see these things clearly which now through the benefit of being able to look back on it or a preterist perspective, past fulfillment perspective, that we can see things clearly. You can't see things clearly, guys, if you're looking for something that is not defined way off in the future. As a matter of fact, every time the coming of the Lord is spoken about, with maybe the exception of one time, it's given a time statement. This is when this is going to happen and who's going to be looking for it and what the context is bears that out. So, having said that, let's uh, think about a few things here. So, we've got the timing here, and we see that this is an aim or a goal, but when was that? Well, I maintain that these things were for the first century, because that's what the context of the entire book of Revelation is about. We have these bookends. In the beginning, the time is soon, it's at hand, so forth. Okay, this was written to the seven churches. Well, where are those seven churches? They're a couple thousand years removed, just about. So it was for that time period. By the time you get to the end of Revelation, it's the same terminology all over again. Think about it like this. He says here in Revelation chapter 22, he says in verse 7, ready for this? Or verse 6, he says, these are things which must soon take place. Verse 7, I am coming quickly. Verse 10, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of, of this book, for the time is near. <laughs> I mean, how much clearer does this have to get? What about in verse 12? Behold, I'm coming quickly. And if, if uh, this isn't enough, by the time you get to verse 20, Jesus says, yes, I am coming quickly. <laughs> Maybe that's not the inflection that he had, but that's how I hear it. And he's stating it, yes, I am coming quickly. So how could it be that these events that are being described in, in any particular section of Revelation before a future undetermined time? It was for their generation. Jesus actually set the timing for all of these events to take place, which was in their generation. He said, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And those concepts we see, that's matter of fact, that's Matthew 16, 27, 28. And we see those concepts born out in the book of Revelation without question. So this timing is for the first century. It's, it has an end. It's not something that's open-ended. And it comes to its end, its fruition, its completeness, its aim, its goal, however you want to put it, in that time frame. Now, is as if that isn't enough to make things so uh, mystical and magical, right? Then we have to deal with this idea of Gog and Magog. Well, I found something very interesting as I was uh, doing some preparation for this. This comes from the website, uh, myjewishlearning.com. Okay, so you might check this out. It's their article entitled Gog and Magog. And the very opening paragraph says this, and I quote, Gog and Magog refers to the enemies against whom God will wage an apocalyptic war at the dawn of the Messianic age. The wars of Gog and Magog have come to be understood as essential to the Jewish eschatological vision of the end of days. A final battle between good and evil that will usher in a period of eternal peace. So 
I read this and I was just kind of geeking out about this. I'm like, wow, they kind of get it. Well, their timing's way off and they are still looking for this in the future. Matter of fact, they're looking for the Messiah to come and they kind of missed that one. Not that uh, they are the Jews of the first century anyway. Uh, they're long gone. What we have today, and no offense to anybody, but hey, the truth is the truth. What we have today is just, it's just another religion and they call it Ju Judaism. Anyway, uh, without going into all that, let's talk about this idea of Gog and Magog, because I, th I think there's just so, so much uh, mystery surrounding this. And it's, it's one of those things that, it, you know, it excites our mind and it, it sends us to a place in our spirituality that uh, nobody else can go. And this belongs to us. And we, you know, people really embrace this concept and they really want, want it to be theirs. So, so they spend a lot of time protecting it. Well, let's see what this is all about. Through history, okay, so let's go through history and see uh, just a few examples through history of what this thing is. If we go back to Alexander's, uh, the Alexander Romances, so, you know, nearly a couple thousand years ago, Gog and Magog are portrayed as cannibals there. Now, obviously, whenever we hear of a people or a place that is cannibalistic, doesn't that kind of scare us? You know, that's frightening and scary. But it paints a picture of what how history portrayed Gog and Magog. So I find it interesting that they're talking about this in the Alexander romances. Hmm, it's kind of, kind of interesting. But even in the Quran, we see that Gog and Magog are, are represented as just called out as being primal, and, or, I'm sorry, primitive and immoral tribes. Well, they got that one right anyway. And I think that, that that is a fair estimation. But it again, it paints this picture of Gog and Magog, two things, as being primitive and immoral. By the time we get to a little more modern British lore, they've taken Gog and Magog, condensed it into one word, kind of like we've done with uh, Brad and Jennifer. I know that's, I'm way off <laughs> time-wise. But, and, and, you know, we call them... Benefer, right? Or something like that. Well, they did this with Gog and Magog, and they made a giant named Gog Magog. So they just crammed it all together, superimposed that on this big evil giant, and he died somehow, and I don't remember all the details about this, in some, some gigantic wrestling match. And you get the picture here. So you paint the picture of this giant. Giants are usually people, things, beings, beasts. Big guys that eat other people, they're cannibals, they're Im primitive and immoral. So you, you get the picture here? You see how, how this has evolved in the, in the popular culture throughout the years. But the fact of the matter is that it has to have some kind of basis. And the basis, I believe, is found in Scripture. Now, I'm not saying that they were necessarily cannibals. I'm not even necessarily saying that they are a they. And we'll see this here in just a moment. But it does stand to reason that the scriptures give us the information. Okay, so here it is. You know, the scriptures are very concerned about Gog and Magog, obviously, in Revelation chapter 20. And here's what he says about Gog and Magog. Verse 8, he says, And will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. So are these nations Gog and Magog? I think that's what he's saying. And I agree with Steve Basin on this one. I was uh, reading his commentary on this section of Revelation, and he said that these are basically the Gentile nations. And I know I'm, I'm just making this very uh, uh, overly simplifying what he said. But I see that there, and I think so many others do too. So there's a lot of debate uh, who the Gentiles are and so forth. But here's the fact. The Gentiles are these nations, Gog and Magog. Well, let's see what the Bible has to say about Gog and Magog. So what we have to do is determine where does the Bible talk about this? Now, interestingly enough about this, there's only really two places that the Bible talks about Gog and Magog. The first one we see in Genesis chapter 10, verse 2, teaches us that Magog was the son of Japheth. Japheth was the son of Noah. And then we see in Ezekiel chapter 38, we see that Magog is essentially 
the topic of the 38th chapter. So let me show you some things here from uh, Ezekiel 38. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward the land or toward Gog of the land of Magog. The prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and so on and so forth. Okay, so here he here we are introduced to Gog of the land of Magog. Now, knowing that Magog was the son of Japheth in Genesis chapter 10, and that Genesis chapter 10 is teaching us about what, 70 nations? And then we see those nations gathered together in one mind, in one language, in the eleventh chapter. Plotting and scheming against God. They aren't trusting Yahweh. They don't give him the time of day, essentially. Well, maybe they do. But, but they don't trust him because they're building this big tower. And just read through Genesis 11 to get the chance. They're building this big tower. Notice how they're building this and the materials that they're using. They're taking the bricks and they're firing them so hard they become stone. And then they take these bricks they put them together with mortar that's made out of tar. Now, what were they trying to do? Seems to me they were trying to waterproof that place. Did they believe God, Yahweh and his covenant, that he would never flood the earth again? They said, they actually said, hey, if, if uh, he's going to scatter us abroad. Well, that's exactly what he did because they didn't trust him. Matter of fact, by that time, they had all pretty much decided to serve other gods and they're not serving Yahweh and, and Yahweh says I'm just sick of it and he confuses their language and he spreads them out and that makes it awful hard for them to uh, to do their evil deeds with one another again and it's been that way ever since and that's exactly what happened but did you notice here that those nations in Genesis 11 were spread out Magog was one of those nations. It was his land, as I see it. And we that makes perfect sense when we go back to Ezekiel chapter 38, and we see here that, that he's speaking. He says, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And if you look at, at Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, these are these nations. Look on your map, and you'll see that they were all four corners of, of the compass, essentially, is, is what happened. And I find that just amazing, and it's obviously significant, and there's a lot there to take in. Gog is not some British lore. It's, it's not uh, something from the Alexander romances or even the Koran. It's from the scriptures, and there's a reason that it's, it's stated this very way. And the reason it's stated that way is because there's a purpose behind it. The reason we have the whole story and we have all of it there, I wish we had time just, just to go through it and read it and, and I'll leave that up to you. But it illustrates that these are the nations of many peoples. Listen to this. By the time you get to verse 6, he says, Gomer with all his troops beyond Tag, uh, Tag, Tagarma, from the remote parts of the north with all its troops, many peoples with you. Be prepared and prepare yourself and all your companies that are assembled about you and be on guard for them. After many days, you will be summoned in the latter years and so on. But you can see this, that these are many nations and many peoples and many tongues. We'll go through this more in just a moment. So this idea of God, and if we want to understand what God is, we have to go back to Ezekiel chapter 38. And then we take that, that information, as Jesus said, and as Peter said, and as, as the other New Testament writers said, you're going to have to go back. You're going to have to understand these Old Testament prophets, these, this Old Covenant prophets, these prophecies from the Tanakh. You're going to have to understand them if you want to understand what's being said. And if, and if that's something that people don't do, then you're just going to plug in your own information about these things. Guys, th this is what's happened. This is why Gog and Magog of Revelation 20 has become so mystified. It's because they are mystified about reading the Old Testament and finding out what it actually means. So you've got Gog, these many nations and many peoples that are assembled for the war. Now, let's talk about the war for just a moment. This idea of the war 
is critical. Because you hear people say, well, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Really? Is that really what's going to happen? Because Jesus plugged that in to be something that was happening in the first century. Well, let's just look at that for just a moment. So we go to Matthew chapter 24. And in Matthew 24, Jesus says in verse 4, See to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name, saying I am the Christ and will mislead many. You will hear... You'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. This is not what he's talking about. As a matter of fact, during the time that Jesus spoke these very words, there was a little thing called the Pax Romana. This was a period of relative peace. Not much war, not much going on on the war front in the Roman Empire. Well, they pretty much conquered everybody. There's nobody left to conquer for the most part. And uh, so, well, you know, what are they going to do? I'm not saying that it was perfect peace and, and nothing was going on, but just, just check that out and you'll see what I'm talking about. Pax Roman. And that's what was going on at this time. But Jesus says, you're going to hear wars and rumors of wars. So these guys are going, well, wait a minute. It's pretty much peaceful now. But notice what he says. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not frightened for these things must take place. But that is not yet the end. He's saying that these physical wars are not the end. These rumors of wars are not the end. It's a sign. It's a part of it. But it's not the end. He says, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. In various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Now this goes, fits nicely with what we were talking about. About this idea of teleo or telos. Right? And it fits very nicely with that idea. That there's this, this time period, there's this process, there's this aim, and there's this goal. And he says it's not yet the end. It's still in process. But notice what he says in verse 9. Then they will deliver to you or deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations because of my name. So you've got these physical things going on, but he says you're going to be persecuted because of your faith. They're going to kill you because of your beliefs of what you teach. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many because lawlessness is increased. Most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now listen to this. This is the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come. So when is the end taking place? It's exactly the same thing that we read in a condensed Form in Revelation chapter 20, verses 7, 8, and 9. Now what you have to understand is Revelation is the Olivet Discourse. So there's nothing that we're going to read in the Olivet Discourse, discourse in, in Matthew or Mark or Luke's version that we will not find in Revelation because that is John's version of the Olivet Discourse. That's the reason it's missing out of, out of uh, his gospel. So when we look at this, we see this, this war that's being talked about. Now, here's a real problem. And this isn't just a problem with understanding the war. This is just a problem in general. I think people become so narrowly focused and they have this, this uh, very rigid literalism. And they see things in a very physical sense. But when we leave the spiritual component out of things, we totally miss the picture. Isn't that what the Bible is all about? Spirituality? Saving your soul? Not your body, your soul. I want to know where your body, physical body, is going to live forever. The scriptures certainly don't teach that. Anywhere. And yet people preach it long and hard. And they insert phrases in there that cannot be found. Like physical resurrection and bodily resurrection. Just show me where those are at. I'll listen. But what we must do is realize is that in this case, as with the rest of the scriptures, there is a spiritual component. Now, the reason there is a physical and a spiritual component is because as human beings, we see things physically. If Jerusalem had not been destroyed, how would we know that things changed spiritually? If Jesus hadn't been physically raised from the grave... The tomb? Come out of that tomb? How would those standing around watching or people throughout history come to understand that he had been spiritually raised? 
You know, if he had just bypassed his body spiritually, went from the Hadean realm to heaven, how would we know? We'd be going, oh, did it happen or not? So there is a physical component, but there is a spiritual component. And we see that evidence about war in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. He says, you know, we're not struggling against powers and principalities. He says it's a spiritual battle that is taking place. And there's no question that this was a spiritual battle. If you think I'm wrong about this, let's just consider a couple things here. We've already looked at Matthew chapter 23. Well, we didn't look at 23, but in 23, we see that these prophets are going to be persecuted. They're going to be put, be put to death. And we know that that's exactly what happened. We read about some of, some of this in Matthew 24. But consider... 2 Thessalonians. Let's look here. 2 Thessalonians. Now, notice what was going on. Verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as it is only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. Now, you need to understand, the apostles were told in Matthew chapter 10 that they would not finish going through the city of, uh, of cities of Israel until the Lord came. In other words, they were going to be chased essentially from city to city to city because of this persecution. They, would, that wouldn't, even, they wouldn't even complete that before the Lord came. Now, either they're still being persecuted and running from city to city there around Israel and haven't made it all of them yet. Or the Lord just came exactly the way he said. And this is what was going on in the first century. They were being persecuted. And they were being afflicted. And they were enduring this. Look at verse 5. This is the plain indication of God's righteous judgment. So that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. The kingdom is coming. It's a whole other sermon. But here it is. It's coming. For after all, it's only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well. When the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. He says these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction. Notice this. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at of all who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. Is there any question that they were going through troubles, trials, tribulation, persecution? And as a matter of fact, we see that there was a great rebellion going on in the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians. This apostasy was taking place. We see that John said that he was a fellow partaker in the tribulation in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. He says, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus. So he says, because of Jesus and what's being taught, there's great tribulation and I'm a partaker of that. So that tribulation was taking place in the first century. If you're going to have this tribulation such as never happened before or ever will again. There's a real problem with that, by the way. If the tribulation is never going to happen again, and that comes at the end when the earth is destroyed, all I have to say to that is, duh, <laughs> it's never going to happen again because there's not going to be anybody left. The language does not support that concept, guys. Listen, okay. He says it's something that will never happen again, but yet there are people that live afterwards. That's the reason it's not going to happen again. Because time does not end. The earth is not destroyed. So this war was very specific. It was to mark the end. It was a part of this process that we read about in Matthew chapter 24 that we have discussed already from Revelation chapter 20. Now the interesting thing about this is this is not all there is about this. And I'm not done with Ezekiel chapter 38. As a matter of fact, I want to spend a whole lot of time talking about that with the remaining time that we have. So when we consider, we go back to Revelation chapter 20. 
Let's just read through a few things here, and we're going to go back between Revelation 20 and Ezekiel 38, and we're going to pick out some of these constituent elements that are found between the two. And they have to be there. And they are there. There's no question about this. So let's just reread Revelation 20. Just a couple of verses here. 7, 8, 9. So when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and he will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. So maybe that now that we've we've looked at Gog and Magog and we're seeing what they are and where they came from and, and what they're not and what they are, that they're, they are these nations. Now it makes more sense to gather them together for the war, for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up upon the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Now, we're going to go back. We're going to pick out some of these things from Ezekiel 38. So just get your Bible. Get it open to Ezekiel 38. We are going to flip back and forth. So here's one of the first things I want you to understand and I want you to see from this. The simplest thing that we have got to understand is that the war happens at the time of the return of the Lord. Okay? So that's evident. Matter of fact, let's look at these three passages in Revelation real quick. So Revelation chapter 16 and verse 14. Here we read. Revelation 16, verse 14. I'm going to go back to verse 13. I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked. And men will not see his shame. And they gather them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Now, what do you see here? So the war is taking place and you've got the return of the Lord. You've got the presence of the Lord. Let me read that again. To gather them together for the war of the great day of God. Is there any question that the great day of God and him coming like a thief is the return of the Lord? There's no question about that. MyJewishLearning.com got it right. At least that portion of it. What about the next passage that we see from Revelation chapter 19? And in verse 19. Here's what this says. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make, should read, the, the definite article, the war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Now, who's sitting on the, or the, uh, the horse and what's his army? This is the Lord. He has, is having his presence. Just go back to verse 11. And you see, I saw heaven open and behold, a white horse and he who sat on it. It's called faithful and true and righteous. And he judges and wages war. When is this? He's present when he's waging the war. He's accomplishing these things. And then what is the time that we see in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 8? It's the war and the presence of the Lord as the city is being surrounded and fire comes down and devours them. So there's no question that the war and the times of the war in these passages happen at the return of the Lord. And so we see the exact same thing about the war and him having his presence in Ezekiel chapter 38 and in verse 20. Listen to this. He says, the, the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all the creeping things that creep on the earth and all the men who are on the face of the earth will shake at my presence. When is this? When Gog of the land of Magog is gathered together for the war. His presence will be there. The mountains also will be thrown, thrown down and so forth. Hmm, isn't that amazing? Look at verse 23. He says, I will magnify myself, sanctify, sanctify myself and make myself known in the sight of many nations and they will know that I am the Lord. Now tell me he doesn't have his presence at this time. 
So all of these events that we're looking at and the similarities between Revelation 20 and Ezekiel 38 happen at the time of his presence. Notice in Revelation chapter 20 that the nations are gathered from the four corners. And we go back to Ezekiel chapter 38 and we see here very clearly verses 1 through 6 that these nations are gathered together. We see it in verse 8. For after many days you will be summoned. In the latter years you will come into the land that is restored from the sword. Did you notice the latter years, by the way? I wish we had time to go over this idea of the latter years. But when are these latter years? At the time of the war. What war? At the presence of the Lord. At his coming. When was that? We've already established this. In the first century. We see that they were gathered together for war. In verse 8 of Revelation chapter 20. He says that they were gathered together for the war. And in, we see in Ezekiel chapter 38, we see the same thing in verses 1 through 6 again. Notice in verse 9, you will go up and you will come like a storm. You'll be like a cloud covering the land. And you will you and all your troops and many peoples with you, they're gathering for the war. Look at verse 15. You will come for, uh, from your place out of the remote parts of the north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great assembly and a mighty army. And you will come and go up against my people, Israel, like a cloud to cover the land. And it shall come about in the last days and so forth. So when is this going to be? And what is it? They're gathered for the war. And this is obviously at Jerusalem. Look at verse 9 in Revelation chapter 20. He says, and they came upon the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. Well, what is this saints and the beloved city? It's Jerusalem. Revelation 11 teaches that, that that's where our Lord was crucified. Is there any question that that's where that is and who that is? And we see the same thing being spoken of in Ezekiel chapter 38 and in verse 12. Notice what it says to capture, spoil, and seize, plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places which are now inhabited and against the people who are gathered from the nations. Who are the people gathered from the nations? And who are they against? Who have acquired cattle and goods who live at the center of the world? Who lives at the center of the world? Well, isn't this, these people gathered out from these nations, the promise of Abraham? A chosen people out of all the others? And where do they live? They live at the navel. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the word. Look at your footnote. Mine foot's in the footnotes there. They they are they live at the navel of the world. This is the, the center of the body. I know there's implications there, but uh, I don't know, maybe it's a naval battle. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't resist that. But these are the people that live in the center of the world, and there's no question who that is. That's Jerusalem. The epicenter of all religion, essentially. Notice in Revelation chapter 20, verses 9 and 10. They came upon the broad plain of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints and, and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So here we see that there is fiery judgment. In Ezekiel chapter 38, we see the same fiery judgment. Ezekiel 38, verse 18. And it will come about that day when God comes against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, that my fury will mount up in my anger, in my zeal and in my blazing wrath. I declare that on that day, there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. Is there any question that the same theme keeps rearing its head between the two chapters, the two sections of scripture? There's no question about that. We see also that this is talking about the last days. Revelation chapter 20, notice verses 11 through the end of the chapter. Is there any question without me going through reading this? for time's sake, that this is talking about the last days. And we see the exact same thing in it's repeated time and time again in, in Ezekiel 38, verse 8, 10, 14, 16, 18, and 19. Is there any question about what these last days are? Not with the evidence we have seen here today. Notice that this also says in Revelation chapter 20, well, not chapter 20. There were no chapter divisions when John the Revelator, 
who wrote the book of the seven seals, <laughs> wrote Revelation. And in chapter 21, notice this, that God, Yahweh, dwells with them. Revelation 21, 1 through 4. He comes down and He dwells with them now. And He wipes away their tears. And there's no longer any death or sorrow or mourning or crying. The first things have passed away. Notice that this first earth passed away. And the holy city of New Jerusalem coming down from heaven from God. Yahweh comes down. And this is the theme, by the way, throughout the rest of, of uh, the book of Revelation. From this point on. That's the whole theme of the book of Revelation, for that matter. So he comes down. Well, what about in Ezekiel? He dwells with him. Check this out. And again, no chapter divisions in Ezekiel either at its original writing. But in chapter 39 and in verse 29, notice what this says. I will no longer hide my face from them any longer. I will not hide my face from them any longer. For I will have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, declares the Lord God. Well, when did that happen in the first century? When does reconciliation take place? When does God no longer hide his face? In the first century, at the time the spirit is poured out. Guys, we've got to see this here. We see also that resurrection takes place. Revelation chapter 20. Notice in verse 13 and 14. This is the resurrection. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Is this not the resurrection? And then, isn't it ironic that the entire section of Scripture... So you've got Ezekiel 36 through 39 for this context of Revelation chapter 20 and 21, roughly. And Ezekiel chapter 37 is all about the resurrection. Well, isn't that just a coincidence? <laughs> we talked about that in the la our last time, time together. What a coincidence. And then finally, and this is, this is where this gets good. Well, it's been pretty good so far. I mean, the power of this, this it's just amazing. The power of this is amazing. I see why Don came up with that phrase. This is powerful. I'm not trying to rip it off, Don. <laughs> this is just powerful. This is what it is. Eden is restored. Revelation chapter 21. Look at verse 6. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. The teleos. Or I'm sorry, telos. Not teleo, telos. Maybe, hey, maybe there is an inclusio there between... Uh, Revelation 20 and verse 7 and 21 and verse 6. Anyway, um, if so, that's pretty cool. I just, I'm seeing this on the fly, right? Anyway, uh, get back to my thought here. It's done. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things. I will be his God and he will be my son. Eden is restored. That relationship is restored. I'm not saying that this earth is Eden. That's not the point. There's a spiritual component, remember? And here's that spiritual component. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 35. Ready for this? I'm telling you when I saw this. Right, let's start at verse 33. Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited, the waste places to be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of being a desolation in the sight of everyone who passes by. They will say this desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden. And Eden is restored at the time of the war of Gog, of the land of Magog in the first century. When all of these things culminate to have their aim and their goal met. And once all that smoke clears, guess what's left? Eden is restored. These are the imager, images and the imagery that they would have understood, should have understood. And we should too, if we study the scriptures and we, we take the references and, and we say, okay, well, okay, well, maybe I should study that before I make an, a, draw a conclusion or an opinion. Well, here's the bottom line to all this, guys. This is all about salvation. Everything that we have talked about here today is 100% about salvation. All prophecy points to the Messiah. 
And it points to the time when Eden can be restored. In other words, that relationship that we had with God, you know, we're united with him again as it was in the Garden of Eden. It's what it's all about. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 says this. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. If you're waiting for kingdom to come, you're, you've uh, missed the boat on that one, guys. Because it says it has the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down and he accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. They did not love their life even when faced with death. Listen to this. All prophecy leads us to Jesus. Now you can choose to accept the fact that Jesus did what he said he was going to do and what was prophesied about him and he fulfilled it all as he said he would in the time frame that he said he would. And then that should cause something, some light bulb inside of your brain to click on and go, oh man, I need to do something about my soul salvation. That's what this is all about. Now, I know I've already read this, but I need to point this out again. Revelation 21, 6 and 7, he said to me, it is done. We're not waiting for our high priest to exit the temple and descend on the ramp and pronounce the atonement. We're not waiting for that anymore. It's already happened. And now we have to do our part about it. And that means we need to be added to his body. We need to be joined with him. There's only one way we can do that, and that's by sharing in his death. Read Romans chapter 6. Read Galatians 3. And you'll see that being clothed in him means being immersed into Jesus Christ. To be buried with him. To be in that baptism. That's what this is all about. So if you're listening to this and you haven't done that and all you've done is get an education in prophecy, well, that's good, but let it do something for you that it was intended to do. And that's to add you to the body of Christ. I am just so thankful that we've had this time to be together and to share these things. And uh, I just I just pray that uh, you'll continue on your journey of study and discovery and just have the mind of the Brians. And whatever it says, whatever's right, just follow it like they did. Study it out. Figure it out. God's okay with that, by the way. But figure it out and be honest with it. Don't have the Facebook attitude. That's, yeah, that's no good. Have the Berean attitude. That's where it ought to be. I love each, each and every one of you, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, John Watson, for your second lesson. Uh, you know, showing us the importance of identifying Babylon in the book of Revelation and the significance for the overall message and, their, and the narrative of eschatology in the book of Revelation. Uh, look, folks, let's face it. The book of Revelation is probably the focus uh, in one way or another, and it is the foundation of futurist eschatologies. All other interpretations of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, most of them come back in one way or another to their view of the book of Revelation and the fact that they claim that it is to be fulfilled in our future. I think John's done a great job of demonstrating that is simply untenable. So we are now ready for William Bell's second lesson. His first lesson focused on the very first of Israel's uh, feast days, the very first four of Israel's feast days, their fulfillment and the eschatological implications of the fulfillment of those first four feast days. Now, he's going to talk to us in this second lesson about the final three of the feast days. That's Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, and Sukkot, the, the Feast of Harvest, the Feast of the Indwell, or Ingathering, Feast of the Dwelling. And here is where we really, really, really get into some of the serious issues with the futurist view. I've got to tell you, on Facebook just recently, I got into an exchange with the Church of Christ minister, and he was trying to talk about the law, having passed away at the cross, trying to set up some, some you know, false dilemmas. Are you telling us that God created 
or committed adultery, married to Israel, and married to the church, and on and on he went. I started asking him when the final three feast days of Israel were fulfilled, because the point of the, the point of his whole of the whole controversy was, when did the law pass away? He insists that it was nailed to the cross. So I kept asking him, when were or when will the last three of Israel's feast days be fulfilled? In post after post after post, and me posing that question, this Church of Christ preacher who supposedly has all the answers for when the law passed away, would not so much as hit one single keystroke to answer that question. And little wonder, look, uh, when, I was, when I was growing up in the Churches of Christ, it was often discussed of how the first four feast days were fulfilled, okay? Pentecost, fulfillment of the last of the first four feast days. But you know what? There was absolute 100% total silence about the last three feast days. So William Bell is going to discuss for us the, the final three of Israel's feast days as depicted as being fulfilled in the book of Revelation. I can assure you this is good stuff. So here's William Bell. Hello, this is William Bell. Welcome to part two of our study on the feast days in Revelation. And we're going to get right down to it, so let's begin, because I believe we have a long way to go and um, not much time to get there. As we have made a case for the first four feasts in the book of Revelation, these were the spring festivals, well, the spring-summer festivals, beginning with Passover, Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, and the Feast of Pentecost. They all relate primarily to the first coming of Christ. Now we're going to look at the fall festivals of the beginning with the uh, or beginning with the feast of trumpets the day of atonement the feast of tabernacles and uh, we'll mention briefly the eighth day feast Shemini Atzeret it's connected with the feast of tabernacles but uh, we probably won't get much time to talk about it these all relate primarily to the second appearing of Christ now they are consummated as the spring summer festivals were inaugural the fall festivals consummate and coincide with the end of the harvest season. So anytime you're reading the New Testament and you read passages that relate to the harvest, such as those you find in Matthew chapter 13, uh, also John chapter 4, etc., you're talking about the feast of, uh, you're talking about the, the fall festivals. And uh, particularly in that particular case, it would be the Feast of Tabernacles, but trumpets is what, happens before that feast arrives. So they are ushered in by the Feast of Trumpets, which began on the first day of the seventh month after the return from Babylonian exile, the name Rosh Hashanah, which means New Year, literally the head of the year, was attached to the feast. And within the same seventh month, the last two important feasts were observed, that is the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur on the tenth day of the feast, uh, on the tenth day of the seventh month, and the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot from the 15th to uh, around the 21st day, because it was a seven-day feast. And next, uh, this is just a chart, uh, basically taken from um, the uh, Blood Moons of by Mark Biltz. But nevertheless, you can see uh, the festival, what they were celebrating, uh, the month according to the Hebrew calendar, and then the Gregorian month. And so the Feast of Trumpets basically focused on the coming king, the Feast of Yom Kippur, uh, which was the Day of Atonement, was the National Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, God dwelling with us. And you can see the um, months that, they, excuse me, the day of the month in which they were celebrated. And of course, Shemini Atzeret, which I don't have here, was the eighth day Feast of the New Beginnings. Now, the Feast of Trumpets in Revelation. It's not explicitly mentioned. The theme of the Feast of Trumpets is frequently found in Revelation. The same is true with Tabernacles and Atonement. And because Revelation is a book about the end or the consummation, the fall festivals predominate. And so the temple or the sanctuary setting also show why the emphasis is on the fall feast days. 
Now, the trumpet was blown for the temple and the feasts. In Numbers chapter 10 and verse 3, the Bible says, When they blow both of them, all the congregation shall gather before you at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And of course, you know, they were talking about the blowing of the trumpets. But notice also in Numbers 10 and verse 10, also in the day of your gladness, in your appointed feasts, and at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. And they shall be a memorial for you before your God. I am the Lord your God. So every single month where there was a new moon, there was a trumpet blown. And those were significant in terms of the coming time of judgment. So you have a very rich sanctuary setting in the book of Revelation, which should not be overlooked because that helps to define several things, as we said in the first video, about the people who were involved, the, the audience, as well as the timing in which the book was written. Since the entire book of Revelation has a comprehensive sanctuary setting with a rich sanctuary festival typology, one would expect to find it in more allusions uh, or find in it more allusions to the feast than in other books of the New Testament. All right, the blowing of the trumpets at the seven new moon festivals in the Old Testament correspond to the blowing of the trumpets in the book of Revelation. Each new moon or trumpet blowing was understood as a day of judgment in the miniature, which warned people to prepare for the final judgment ushered in by the Feast of Trumpets. Now, the blowing of the first six trumpets in Revelation warns people to prepare for the final judgment inaugurated by the blowing of the seventh trumpet. And you find that in Revelation 9, 20 through 21, also Revelation 11 and verse 18. But those trumpets are uh, mentioned in Revelation uh, 8. You can see uh, the blowing of the six trumpets. Now, the shofar. On the Feast of Trumpets, the shofar, or the trumpet, is blown 100 times. Three sounds are made with the trumpet. Takiyah is one long straight blast. The shevarim is three shorter blasts. And teruah is nine quick blasts in short succession. The 100th blast on the Feast of Trumpets is known as the last trump. Also, these feasts, uh, the Feast of Trumpets reflects God's desire to summon his people to repentance so that he can vindicate them on the Day of Judgment. And the name of the feast is derived from the blowing of the trumpets or the shofar, which was its distinguishing characteristic. The massive blowing of the shofar on the first day of the seventh month was understood by the Jews as the beginning of their trial before the heavenly court, where the books would be opened and the destiny of each individual would be decided. The trial lasted 10 days until the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, which God would dispose of their sins in a permanent way. And so you have the Feast of Trumpets on the first day of the seventh month, and then 10 days later, they, or within that 10 days, they had these 10 days of penance and uh, where they would afflict themselves in sackcloth and ashes, etc., and repent of their sins if they were uh, humble. Then you would have the final disposition of their sins on the Day of Atonement. Now, uh, the massive blowing of trumpets, or the shofar, which as its distinguishing uh, characteristic, the massive blowing of the shofar on the first day of the seventh month was understood by the Jews as the beginning of their trial before the heavenly court, where these books would be opened and the destiny of each individual would be decided. And so uh, during this 10 days where, uh, or penitence, where they would um, afflict themselves, they served not only to call upon the Jews to repent, but also to reassure them that God would remember and vindicate them on the day of judgment. It was the inauguration of the judgment process that culminated in the Day of Atonement with the final disposition of all the sins committed during the previous year. Now, the Feast of Trumpets served to call the Jews to stand trial before the heavenly court, but it escalates in the New Testament to the angels blowing the trumpets, which you see in the book of Revelation. Several passages demonstrate this focus on the judgment. One, they were crying in the midst of heaven to announce to mankind the beginning of the time of judgment, Revelation 11 and verse 18. But it's important to understand that this time of judgment was connected to the consummation and the destruction of Babylon, Revelation 14, verses 7 and 8. In this text, the Bible says, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, 
and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of the water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city, because he has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So that seventh trumpet is associated with the fall of Babylon, which in, this is Mystery Babylon, in the book of Revelation, which is the great city, the uh, city which was spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, the city where the Lord was crucified, and that would be Jerusalem. So that's showing you the emphasis both on the fall of Jerusalem, the temple, and the connection with the Feast of Trumpets related to that event. Again, you see it in Revelation 16, verses 17 through 19. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city, there again is your reference to the great city, great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then again, later on in the book, Revelation 19 and verse 2, the text says, For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. And you can see that avenging of the blood in chapter 18, verses 20 and 24. Oh, God avenged the blood of all the saints and the prophets, of course, and the apostles on her. That alludes back to Matthew chapter 23, where they were told to fill up the measure of their father's guilt. Again, 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 16, and Revelation 17, where the cup of iniquity is full. Again, focusing on Jerusalem. So you can see that the Feast of Trumpets is associated with that event. Very important when we understand the judgment passages in the book of Revelation. Now, the trumpet call was to the hidden day. It is the Yom HaKesa. Excuse me for any uh, mispronunciations of these terms. But that was the hidden day. In Zechariah 14, 6, it says, On that day there shall be no light, nor cold weather, nor frost. It shall be for one day, and that day is known to the Lord and not a day, and not a night, and at evening time there should be light. Now that's a quote from the Septuagint. Uh, in Matthew 24, 36, this same day is referenced. This is the day that every time you hear people talk about the coming of the Lord, um, and when it is going to occur, especially as it relates to time, uh, they would cite this text to say, well, nobody knows the day and the hour. Uh, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Well, this was the day of trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets. Hebrews knew that it would come every single year. They knew it would be on the first day of the seventh month. They just didn't know the specific day and hour that would occur because they had to have watchers or spotters for the new moon who would relay that information to the priest who would then confirm it and signify the time that the blowing of the trumpets would begin. Those who are familiar with the background and the meaning of the Feast of Trumpets would understand what Jesus was saying and that he had uh, already mentioned this once before because he spoke of it in verse 31 when he talks about he would gather together his elect from the four winds of the earth with the sound of the trumpet. That's what that day is all about. So it's not a day that could not be known, but it was a day that they were very familiar with. And so this is the Jewish idiom. This is all in the context of the Hebrew scriptures, and what they knew. They would recognize what was meant by the hidden day. They would not understand it to be a day that was not going to occur in their lifetime because for 1,500 years, every single year, they had experienced it, and these were God's appointed feasts that were actually uh, prophetic and typological of the coming day of judgment. Also, we have the Feast of Trumpets in terms of the awakening blast that was another name for the feast of trumpets it was called the awakening blast when you read the book of revelation it opens with an allusion to the feast of trumpets when the lord said i was in the spirit or john said i was in the spirit on the lord's day and i heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet revelation 1 and verse 10 well this is signifying what time in the hebrew calendar this was it was the time for the Feast of Trumpets, this uh, loud voice as the sound of a trumpet. But it was also a call to the temple. Remember what we said from Numbers chapter 10, verse 3, 
when they blow both of them, all the congregation shall gather before you at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And so an announcement of the day of judgment. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 17, the text says, For the time has come for the judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with this first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? So there's a direct correlation with the Feast of Trumpets, the house of God, and the fact that they were called to gather uh, as a result of those trumpets. Now, it was also a call to the day of judgment, the Yom Hadin, uh, which is the day of judgment. The Gospels spoke of imminent judgment, Matthew 16, verses 27 and 28. For the Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father with his holy angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So the Lord was about to come to judge, and some who were standing in his presence would not die until that event occurred. That is the Feast of Trumpets. That's being referred to because it's the time of judgment. Again, the eminence is spoken of in the book of Acts 17 and verse 31, because he has appointed a day in which he is about to judge the living and the dead. And so once again, we see that he was about to judge the living and the dead. This eminent judgment is spoken of in the Gospels, in the book of Acts. It's also spoken of in the epistles. In 2 Timothy 4, 1, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is about to judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. And for this reason, when the book of Hebrews was written, the text says that uh, they were not to forsake the assembling or the gathering of themselves together as was the manner of some, inasmuch as they could see that day, that's the Lord's day of Revelation 1.10, approaching. And again, 1 Peter 4, 17, as we've mentioned. And so this text, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, uh, is not the first day of the week. This is a text that referred to the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, excuse me, the Feast of Trumpets. And it was uh, referencing the day of judgment and this call to the temple of God for that purpose. Now, it was also a trumpet call to the kingdom, the Ha Melech, uh, the coronation of the Messiah. In Revelation 3, 20 through 21, the text says, and this is kind of uh, a double uh, reference here, but uh, we should see with that also the Feast of Trumpets. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Now, in the first lesson, I talked about it in relation to the Passover meal and the fulfillment of this messianic banquet. But nevertheless, it also focuses on the time of the coming of the kingdom and once again, uh, the focus on the Feast of Trumpets. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now compare that and connect that with Revelation 11 and verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So it's the coronation of the Messiah. It's the Lord coming in glory in his kingdom, as we uh, mentioned in Matthew 16, 27 and 28, also Matthew 25 and verse 31. Next, we have the trumpet call to the wedding. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because the themes that we find in the book of Revelation are associated with the Feast of Trumpets. So when we read about the marriage of the Lamb in Revelation 19 and in chapter 21, etc., and in 22, uh, again, the reference is to the Feast of Trumpets. The Bible speaks, or, or the term for that is the Ha Kiddushin, and, uh, or Kedushin, uh, again, you know, don't hold me um, accountable for the pronunciation of these Hebrew terms. Uh, but nevertheless, it is the wedding of the Messiah. Revelation 19, 7 through 9, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. So uh, it's not just by happenstance that we have the feast of trumpets in the book of Revelation and we have the connection with the wedding because that is a part of what the feast of trumpets represented. It was the time of the wedding feast. And so to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Again, in Revelation 21, 2, John saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, 
coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And Revelation 21, 9, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the notice, seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. So again, that's why you have it. And that's also why you find the parable of the wedding in Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13, where it says that the kingdom of heaven is like the wedding. That text about the bridegroom who goes out to meet the wedding party uh, is all about the Feast of Tabernacles, right there in connection with the destruction of the temple and the city in Matthew 24. Same thing in Matthew 22 in Luke 14, where you have references to the marriage as well. Uh, they are all connected. Now, it was a trumpet call to the opening of the books, to open the books, the Yom Hadin, the opening of the books. Daniel 7 and verse 10 alludes to this. A uh, fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousands time, ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. So think about Revelation chapter 20, which you find in verse 12. I, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, etc. The dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. So here we have the Feast of Trumpets alluded to. Now there's also the Day of Atonement connected with it because they were all very closely connected. But um, the focus on the Feast of Trumpets in terms of the opening of the books, because that was another name for the Feast of Trumpets. But it was also a call to open the gates. That's another uh, signification of the Feast of Trumpets. The Yom Hadin also meant the opening of the gates. Now, I would suggest that the opening of the gates here refer to the opening of the gates of Hades. Uh, but that's not to exclude that it would refer to the opening of the gates of the house of God, the new temple of God. And so we'll see both in that. But I do think there's a reference to the opening of the gates of Hades. In Matthew 16 and the verses 18, the Bible says, and I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So that was one of the promises that the Lord made was that he was going to build his church, but he said the gates of Hades would not prevail against it. Of course, we understand that people were imprisoned in Hades, and as long as Hades stood, it was prevailing against the church. However, the Lord said it would not ultimately do so. And so in Revelation 1.18, I believe this is why this text is uh, introduced here. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. So Jesus is indicating his victory over Hades. And he says, amen. But he also says, and I have the keys of Hades and of death, the authority to open this and to allow the dead, the righteous ones to come forth and to enter into the blessings of the Lord. And so in Revelation eleven eighteen, the nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead, which were rare in Hades, that they should be judged, and you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and destroy those uh, who destroy the earth. So in Revelation 20 and verse 13, once again, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. So there's your opening of the gates. There's the indication of the Feast of Trumpets and the sign significance of that name as far as the opening of the gates. Once again, I also said that that doesn't exclude the opening of the gates to refer to the temple, because when they were released from Hades, where did they go? They entered into the most holy place, into the temple of God. And so Revelation 21, 12, and 13, also she had a great and high wall with 12 gates, 12 angels at the gates, and the names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, three gates on the east, on the north, on the south, and three gates on the west. And so 20, 21, 25 says, its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. So these gates are continually open to allow those to come in uh, on a continual basis. Revelation twenty two fourteen. blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter 
through the gates into the city. So I would say that it refers to both the opening of the gates of Hades, but also the opening of the gates to the house of God that uh, men may enter in. Then it was a trumpet call to resurrection. We've already alluded to that, touched on a couple of passages there. But in 1115, then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven. Of course, it was the time of the kingdom of God. But you see, these things are all uh, in correlation with one another. They are constituent elements. That's why, once again, 2 Peter 4 and verse 1, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is about to judge the living and the dead at his kingdom and, or at his appearing and his kingdom. And so in verse 18, the nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged. So the sounding of the trumpet, the last angel to sound, the seventh angel, was also the calling forth of the dead. This is a major theme in the book of Revelation, but you also see it woven throughout the uh, Old Testament as well as the uh, New Testament and uh, the Gospels, I would say, and the epistles. In Isaiah 27, and the verses are 12 and 13, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day, that's the Lord's day, that the Lord will thresh from the channel of the river to the brook of Egypt, and you will be gathered one by one. So there's the gathering. O you children of Israel, so it shall be in that day, the great trumpet will be blown. They will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria, and they who are outcasts in the land of Egypt, and they shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. So there's the Old Testament text that talks about the great trumpet which will be blown, and that is the time of the gathering. It is also the time of the resurrection. And it's in uh, calling them to worship the Lord in the holy mount in Jerusalem, which is a reference to the temple. But notice also in Matthew 24 and 31, which I don't have on the screen, but once again he says, and he shall gather together his elect from the four winds with the sound of a trumpet. There is the text that's associated with his coming and glory on the throne. It is associated with those who would mourn in the land of Israel and therefore the sound of the great trumpet, which means that he's calling them forth to raise them from the dead. Uh, that is a parallel text to those in both 1 Corinthians and in Thessalonians. In 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, which we've been doing quite a bit of study on our, our weekly Sunday morning broadcast, but he says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then tie that in with Revelation eleven fifteen, which we've just covered, and the seventh angel sounded. But remember, this is all in connection with the fall of the city of Babylon. And so that means every single one of these texts are connected together, as we've seen from the Old Testament text of Isaiah, from the New Testament text of Matthew 24, 31, in the context of the fall of Jerusalem that occurred before that generation passed away. And that shows the continuity and consistency of all of these texts because they're all related to the same event, the Feast of Trumpets. Now we moved on to the Day of Atonement, which was the annual cleansing of sin on the Day of Atonement, which escalated in the New Testament into the final and permanent removal of sin at Christ's coming. This is Hebrews chapter 9, verses 23 through 28, where we see Christ uh, with his own blood entering into the holy places not made with hands to appear in the presence of God for us. And the scripture says that he would often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now that shows you also that the Day of Atonement was not, or the Atonement specifically, was not completed in Jesus' death. We have so many who believe that Atonement was completed. And they think that those of us who are full preterists and who see the inaugural, the appropriation, as well as the consummation of the Day of Atonement they see us as denigrating the cross of Christ. No, it's not a denigration of the cross of Christ. It is what brings out the full meaning of the cross of Christ. If you go back to the Old Testament 
and look in the ninth chapter of Leviticus, you will see where the high priest had to make an offering for himself and uh, his family, and he had to also offer for the sins of the people. And when the offering was complete, then the glory of the Lord would appear. This is when he would come out of the temple and he would bless them. But with what you have at the cross is you have Jesus dying, but he has to enter into the holy places made without hands with his blood in order to make the atonement. That's what Hebrews chapter 9 is all about. And that's what the book of Revelation is all about. It's about Christ being in the most holy place with the offering of his blood in order to secure redemption through uh, the offering on the day of atonement. And it is consummated in the time of the fall festivals. I want you to think about this. If we were to go to Leviticus chapter 9, and I'm going to see if I can find uh, my Bible, which I don't have, but uh, let's see if I can find a, um, a text here in Leviticus chapter 9, and I want us to note uh, something in the text. One of the things that the Bible says very, very clearly was that they were to make the offering for the feast of, or for the day of atonement on the 10th day of the seventh month. That's Leviticus chapter 23. I believe it's also in Leviticus 9, but we know that it is in Leviticus chapter 23. Now, this is important because it tells you that the day of atonement was on the 10th day of the seventh month, but Jesus died on the 14th day of the first month. How do we confuse the first day of the first month with the 10th day of the seventh month for the day of atonement? Atonement is not completed until the 10th day of the seventh month. And so, yes, the sacrifice was offered, but that sacrifice had to be presented in the most holy place before the Father in order that these sins would be removed. And that is a very, very important point. I suggest you go and read those passages on that. If you understand the feast days, you would understand very clearly how the Day of Atonement was on the 10th day of the seventh month and not the 14th day of the first month in terms of it being consummated. And this is why we've shown the beginning, the interim, and the consummation of these feast days, particularly the fall festivals. They don't just happen all in the fall, but they did have a beginning and, um, a, you know, a beginning from the time of Jesus's ministry. And that's why his ministry instituted that. That's why Hebrews 9 verses 26 through 28 are right there in the same context. He then would have suffered often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this judgment, so Christ also was once offered to bear the sins of many, and to those who eagerly wait for him, he would appear a short time apart from sin for salvation. That is the consummation of of the atonement, and that's why the text in Hebrews 10, 1 starts off, for the law having a shadow of the things about to come. So the fulfillment of the shadow wasn't completed on the cross. It was fulfilled in that coming day of the Lord in chapter 10 and verse 25, which was coming in a very, very little while. All right, this is the temple court scene. Revelation opens with this temple court scene. It is a scene manifesting Christ in his deity as king, as high priest, and as judge. His ascension revealed the following. He was to go away to the Father's house. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, abiding places, etc. Some translations say mansions. And he says, I go to prepare a place for you there, and, and I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you will be also. So he was going to prepare this place. Again, in Leviticus 9, in Leviticus 16, the high priest also had to anoint the holy place, the temple, the vessels, everything in it. 
He's sprinkled with blood, preparing it for God's glorious appearing to the people. And this Jesus had to do in preparing this place. And that's what we see him doing in the book of Revelation when the chapter opens. Furthermore, in Acts 1, 9 through 11, where most people are only focused with the uh, what they would uh, erroneously view as the visual uh, appearance of Christ, and all they can see there is just you know a physical appearance of Christ riding on the cloud, but they fail to see this is his ascension into the most holy place. That's what the cloud is all about. That's why he appears, or rather he ascends out of their sight because he's ascending back into the presence of the Father. That's what all these clouds are all about. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20 says he entered the holy places made without hands. Again, tie that together with Hebrews 9, 24, where he enters the most holy place with his own blood to appear in the presence of God for us. Now, that ties this appearance of Christ in the book of Revelation with Daniel. And the point is, his appearance is as a high priest in the temple of God. Now, notice what Daniel says in Daniel 7 and verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was pure like wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. When you look at all the theophanies in the Old Testament of the throne of God, you see this language, and you see that this is, a, this is temple language. This is God in the most holy place, on his throne. And then Daniel 10, 5, and 6, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, and whose waist was girded with the gold of Euphaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. And of course, when Daniel saw this uh, appearance, uh, it frightened him, etc. And uh, because he understood that this was the divine presence of God. And so this is what is being portrayed. In Revelation 1, 12 through 16, John says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Where, where were they? In the temple of God. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet. That's his priestly robe. And girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair was white like wool and white as snow. And his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. The sun, the, the, the bright light, all of this typified the appearance of a divine being. And so this is Christ being revealed in his deity. This is him being revealed as the divine son of God, unlike his humility when he was on earth. And this is very important for us to recognize, but he's appearing as high priest in the temple of God. And that's why we have the uh, association of the Feast of Trumpets and of the Day of Atonement uh, pretty much together. So it was the opening of the most holy place. It's noteworthy that the announcement of the judgment is followed by the opening of the most holy place of the heavenly temple. We've alluded to Revelation 11, verse 15 and 18 several times because that was the time when the seventh angel sounded and it was the time when uh, of God's wrath and when the dead would be judged. But immediately after that announcement at the, seventh, the sounding of the seventh trumpet, it says the heavenly temple, which is the house that is not made with hands and where the Ark of the Covenant was seen, was opened in heaven. So here is the temple being opened at the time of the judgment. This is God's uh, opening of this temple, and yet he's telling us that it is in connection with the sounding of the seventh trumpet. It is after that trumpet sounded. So uh, very important. The Day of Atonement was the grand climax of Israel's religious year. 
The rites performed on that day concluded the atoning process of the sin of Israel by removing them permanently from the sanctuary. So their sins were removed. It was the culmination of the judgment process in which God executed his judgment by giving life to those who had confessed their sins and availed themselves of the divine provision of their atonement. It also emphasized the total cleansing of all sin, Leviticus 16, 26, verse 30, and also verse 34. And so it had an emphasis on judgment, on sin and atonement, fasting and prayer. It was designed to drive home the importance of the seriousness of sin, of the divine provision for its eradication through confession, sacrifice, recording, judgment, and final disposition. And that's why these themes are found in the book of Revelation. It taught Israel that before their sins could be permanently eliminated on the day of atonement, they had to be repented of, forsaken, and judged by the heavenly court. And so it's alluded to in the book of Hebrews very, very predominantly and strongly. As a matter of fact, the entire book of Hebrews is about the priesthood and about the coming day of atonement. And that is also the backdrop of Revelation. And so you have this antitypical cleansing and removal of sin by Christ at his return. We've alluded to Hebrews 9, 26 through 28, the background of that, Leviticus 9 and verse 16. Christ appeared in what was the then present time. And that's why he says now in terms of his appearing to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself and now to appear in the presence of God for us. That was now time in the first century. And so he would appear a second time, the time that the old covenant was fulfilled. Revelation eleven nineteen, as we had just spoken, serves as a dividing point between the first half of Revelation reflecting the daily liturgy versus the second half, which mirrors the annual ritual of the Day of Atonement. And the visions of the second half of Revelation focus inside the temple where the central activities of the Day of Atonement took place. And so, again, you can't separate the temple, you can't separate these feast days uh, from that, and we're looking at these fall festivals from that perspective. And that, again, is Leviticus 23. All right, so let's move on. The wicked were destroyed by the sword. You have Revelation 19.21, which is a reminder that the impenitent who were cut off on the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 23 and verse 29, uh, Satan is bound, he's thrown into the pit, a reminder of the sending of the scapegoat into the desert. The righteous are resurrected and reign with Christ, a reminder of the cleansing of God's people on the Day of Atonement, which resulted in the Jubilee celebration of new beginnings, Leviticus 25 and verse 9. And the correlation between the Day of Atonement and Christ's return shows how important it is in understanding Christ's coming. You can't separate uh, the Day of Atonement, these feast days, from Christ's coming. Just trying to separate it from the Hebrew festivals is a total misapplication and understanding of the second appearing of Christ. Every text in the New Testament that talks about his second appearing should be understood in relation to the fulfillment typologically of these feast days. And so it embodies the good news of God's provision of cleansing of sin and restoration of fellowship with him through Christ's atoning sacrifice. All right, now let's uh, finally get down to the Feast of Tabernacles. This was the most joyous and festive occasion in the Old Testament times called the Feast of Ingathering, Exodus 23, 16 and 34, 22, the Feast of Booths or Sukkot, Deuteronomy 16, verse 13, uh, Leviticus 23 and 34. Sukkot means booths or huts or tabernacles, uh, or, which is translated tabernacles. It was a Thanksgiving celebration for the blessings of harvest. It commemorated God's protection of his people as they dwelt in booths during the sojourn in the wilderness, Leviticus 23, 34, and also 43, Deuteronomy 16, 13, 31, and 10. There were multiple sacrifices offered on the Feast of Tabernacles. In fact, on no other occasion were so many sacrifices offered on a single day. And you can see that in Leviticus 23, 36, and also Numbers 29, verses 12 to 39. And these temporary booths symbolized the human need to depend upon God for his provision of food, water, and shelter, themes that you find uh, in the book of Revelation. Another major ritual of the Feast of Booths was the waving of a bundle of willow, myrtle, and palm branches. They also prayed for rain, which was an important part of the ritual of the Feast of Booths because it had to do with the abundance of the harvest. Palestine was not rich in water resources. The rainy season starts about the time of the Feast of Booths, 
and thus the appropriate time to pray for rain. Now, in Zechariah 14, verses 16 through 19, which shows the fulfillment that was being worked out in the book of Revelation as far as the Feast of Tabernacles was concerned, says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, on them, notice, there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague which the Lord strikes, with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment. And actually, the original rendering says this shall be the sin of Egypt and the sin of all the nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So when God fulfilled this Feast of Tabernacles, as we see in the book of Revelation, he was saying all the nations that do not come up to keep it, this would be their sin, and upon them there would be no rain. So in other words, the blessings of atonement, the blessings of salvation are withheld from them. Also associated with the Feast of Tabernacles was a water drawing ceremony. There were prayers for rain, as we've just indicated, which were offered in conjunction with the popular water drawing ceremony. The water was drawn at the Pool of Siloam in a golden pitcher by a priest who carried it to the temple accompanied by a procession of faithful worshipers. The water was poured on the altar while the people chanted to the accompaniment of flutes, the great halal, consisting of Psalms 113 through 118. It was at the conclusion of this ceremony that Christ offered his living water. And so when you read in the Gospel of John, where Jesus speaks with the woman at Samaria and tells her to give him a cup of water, and he tells her that if she had known who it was who was speaking with her, she would have asked of him living water, out of which would flow uh, rivers of living water unto eternal life. And again, you find a reference to the living water in John 7, which we'll talk about again in just a moment. But another aspect of the Feast of Tabernacles was nightly illumination. This was a significant ceremony involving nightly illumination of the temple's court of women with gigantic candelabra, which provided light for the nightly festivities. Revelation 1 and 12 refers to this golden candlestick, uh, etc., or the candelabra. And uh, we also have in Revelation 21 and verse 23, where it says, There was no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its light. There is no night there. And so this idea of the nightly illumination, because the Lamb is light. Remember in John 1, where the Bible says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. That's a reference to Jesus Christ himself being the tabernacle of God. But it was also an indication of his statement in John 8 and verse 12 when he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And that's alluded to as well uh, in the prophets. So the Feast of Tabernacles in the New Testament reveals the nature and the mission of Christ. In the epistles and revelation, it reveals Christ's mission to protect his people during the tribulation and trials of the second exodus until they reach the heavenly Jerusalem in consummation. And that's what was being worked out in the New Testament, which we can see from the Gospels and uh, Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration, Luke chapter 9, the Bible says he was about, Moses and Elijah appeared to him to speak with him about his decease or his exodus, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem, Luke 9, 31. And in the um, in book in First Corinthians, again, an allusion to the Exodus in the Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, allusion to the Exodus. So this is what was being worked out, this second Exodus. And just as the Lord was a pavilion, a booth, a covering for Israel during the first Exodus, you have him following the same role in the second exodus until they reach uh, the consummation. So Jesus is introduced in the Gospel of John as 
the tabernacle, as the tent of Israel. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And the Word was made flesh and tabernacled among us. The word uh, skenao is a verb. And it says that the Lord was made flesh and he tabernacled among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So John is introducing Christ as the new tabernacle, as the tabernacle of God, which indicates, once again, the eminence of the fulfillment, but also it indicates that the Feast of Tabernacles was uh, had a beginning and an end point, and Jesus coming in his first coming uh, as the Feast of Tabernacles. But notice, he comes in a fleshly tabernacle in the first coming, but the second coming, he comes in the house not made with hands, and that should say quite a bit about the second appearing of Christ and what it's all about. He is the living water that was signified by the ceremony of the Feast of Tabernacles, which we alluded to a moment ago, John 7, 37 and 38, when he cried out at the feast on that great day of the feast, when he said, he who believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This he spoke concerning the spirit, which had not yet been given because the Lord was not yet glorified. And again, uh, it was at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, because the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand, John chapter 7 and verse 2, that Jesus is making these statements. We have him saying, I am the light of the world. As John 1 said, the light shined in the darkness. If you take in consideration the nightly illumination that was a part of the Feast of Tabernacles celebration, then you can see how Jesus comes to the darkness of Israel to light up the world in the night of their sin as the true tabernacle of God. And so the Feast of Tabernacles depict the destiny of, of God's people from Revelation uh, chapter 7, verse uh, 9, also uh, uh, verses 9 through uh, 17, and also 21, 1, and 22, and verse 5. So let's, um, let's take a look at some of those passages in the text. These are the major themes of the Feast of Tabernacles. They reveal the nature of the mission of Christ. You have the final ingathering of God's people in their harvest home. The redeemed are described as bearing palm branches, which is a feature of tabernacles that we've already alluded to. So in Revelation chapter 7, and the verse is 9, after these things I looked and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. Again, direct allusion to the Feast of Tabernacles. And in verse 10, it says, And crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This recalls the cry of Hosanna of Psalm 118 and verse 25, which was used at the feast. And so in verse 15, but the reference to God erecting a booth over Israel with his presence in Revelation 7 and verse 15, it says, therefore, they are before the throne of God. These are those who come out of the great tribulation. So they're coming out of this wilderness wandering, out of this period of trial Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne, notice, will dwell among them, will tabernacle among them. He who sits on the throne will dwell among them. This takes us back to Exodus chapter 13, where during the time of Israel's wandering in the wilderness, we had the pillar of a cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. So, uh, God was there protecting Israel. He was there providing Israel. And what was he doing? Now, remember, they were in the desert with all of this heat. They were in the desert where in the night, in the darkness, there was probably little to guide them along. I mean, can you imagine walking through sand and desert where there's no 
no kind of landmark or anything uh, to follow them along. But when we look in Isaiah chapter uh, 4, we find a little bit about what might have been involved with God being their tabernacle. And so in uh, Isaiah chapter 4, starting in verse 5, the text says, Then the Lord will create above every dwelling place of Mount Zion and above her assemblies a cloud and a smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. Go back to the Exodus and think about what God was doing. And he says, For over all the glory there will be a covering and there will be a tabernacle for shade in the daytime. So God was shielding them from the heat with the cloud that covered them for a place of refuge to protect them from any enemies, etc., and for a shelter from the storm and the rain. So here is God protecting them from, from harm during that time. And so back to Revelation, when you look at uh, chapter 7, verses 16 and 17, something else that was significant in Revelation chapter 7, the text says in verse 16, they shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. Remember during the time of the wilderness when they cried out and said they had no food, God fed them with bread from heaven, with the manna from heaven. And then again in chapter 17, when they said we have no water and God gave them water from the rock. And the Bible tells us the food and the rock was of Christ. And so once again, here is God providing for them with this Feast of Tabernacles. So in Revelation 7, 16, they shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away all tears from their eyes, which means they're going to enter into this time of rejoicing because that's what the Feast of Tabernacles was all about. It was about rejoicing for all of the blessings that God had given them in the time of the harvest and for the coming new year. And so in summary of the three feasts, we have repentance being involved with the Feast of Trumpets because it was leading to uh, the court scene and the Day of Judgment where their fate would be decided as to whether they lived or died, whether their sins would be removed or not. The Day of Atonement, where they would receive cleansing through the atoning sacrifice, and particularly here through the blood of Christ, a once-for-all-time cleansing from sin. And then the rejoicing at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles for the bountiful harvest that God gave, acknowledging how he had carried them through the second exodus into the heavenly Canaan, which results into the coming of of the new heavens and new earth in Revelation 21, the time of the wedding, the bride, and the fulfillment of the living waters, the tree of life, which is for the healing of the nations. And thus, they all remind us of our relationship to God. Our thoughts, words, and deeds count for eternity. Our lives are revealed either as self-centered or immoral or God-centered and morally upright. And we must go through judgment and repentance to celebrate uh, in the age to come, which is what they did. And um, that demonstrates how these fall festivals are um, predominant in the book of Revelation, and they show us the meaning of the book to be understood in no other way by no other contemporary group than the first century audience to whom it was written. And they also demonstrate the imminence of that event because uh, these were the events that were uh, connected together in the last days. Well, I hope that we brought some clarity to the meaning of the feast days in Revelation, and uh, thank you for uh, your time, and thank you for listening. Well, you know, here we are, folks, at the end of another Preterist Pilgrim Weekend. I hope you have enjoyed our virtual Preterist Pilgrim Weekend. It's certainly different. I want to express my appreciation. First of all, uh, I, I just got to do this. My appreciation to Alan Morton, for organizing, doing all of the technical uh, behind the scenes stuff to get it all organized, to put it together uh, so that it makes it easy for you to view these lessons. Uh, it took a tremendous amount of work. And by the way, it was his, it was his idea. Uh, you know, we were just going to cancel the Preterist Pilgrim Weekend and he came up with the idea. And so I, I, just, I just have to give a great big shout out uh, to Alan Morton my webmaster, for coming up with the idea to present this virtual 
uh, Preterist Pilgrim Weekend, and then for doing all of the work to get it properly organized. Obviously, also, I want to express my profound appreciation for all of our speakers and the great job they've done. Look, uh, I, I've got to tell you, if you have never put together a PowerPoint presentation to try to make everything that you want to say fit into 40 or 45 minutes, you literally have no idea how long it takes, how much dedication it takes, how much organization that it takes. Uh, I have been over my three lessons, my PowerPoints, I, I can say that I have safely been over them no less than 20 times. Editing, revising, adding, deleting. I can also say it probably has taken no less than 30 to 40 hours per lesson to get everything organized, to do the research. And I know that that's true of the other speakers as well. Now, look, uh, you know, my, uh, my PowerPoints are, are pretty basic. I can do a transition. I can do a little bit of an, an animation. But when it comes to guys like Daniel Rogers and some of the fantastic work that they do, like William Bell does uh, in his charts as well, uh, I just said I'm in, I'm in utter amazement of that because I know the time that it takes to do that. And so we really, really appreciate the, effort, the time, the effort, the research that our speakers have put into presenting to you for your understanding, for your growth in knowledge of the book of Revelation. I believe that this conference will, will be of a great benefit for people who watch online for literally for years to come. Well, I've got to get directly into my lesson. And so let me begin by giving just a very, very brief uh, encapsulation, recapitulation of what we have seen up to this point. All right? I started out by telling you that I believe that there is a wealth of information, a wealth of documentation that proves that the millennium was approximately, and remember, I, when I say the, the millennium ended in A.D. 70, that's, that's a rough figure, all right? I'm simply stating that it ended in the first century. I understand that there are some fine technical details along the way, but again, I'm just speaking generically. But I believe that there is a wealth of information that proves, pardon me, that the millennium was the period of the second exodus. The sex, second exodus motif, language, themes, permeates the book of Revelation. And just like the first exodus of 40 years ended with Israel's entrance into her, her new world, the book of Revelation has the end of the millennium with Israel's entrance into the new creation. Not only Israel, all who join with her enters into the eternal, endless, glorious new heaven and the new earth. Now, the key point that I've been trying to share with you and to focus on is the fact that the book of Revelation, and we started with Revelation chapter 20, remember, the book of Revelation presents the destruction of creation, of heaven and earth, or earth and heaven, if you please, at the end of the millennium. So let me reiterate my primary, my fundamental, my beginning argument. Number one, the destruction of creation in the book of Revelation occurs at the end of the millennium, Revelation 20, 10 and following. Look, that's undeniable. I don't know anybody that tries to deny that. However, the destruction of creation in Revelation occurs at the judgment of Babylon under the guise of the name Satan. Babylon is the harlot city guilty of shedding all of the blood of all the martyrs. In other words, the end of the millennium is the time of the vindication of the martyrs. Babylon in Revelation was none other than Old Covenant Jerusalem. John Watson's done a great job documenting that for us. 
And in my book, Who Is This Babylon? I spend the whole book basically identifying Babylon in Revelation as Old Covenant Jerusalem. Now what that means, therefore, is that the destruction comes at the end of the millennium at the judgment of Old Covenant Jerusalem, i.e. Babylon. Now we closed out our last lesson with an extensive look, or our last lesson focused on, an extensive look at Revelation chapter 11. I noted that Revelation chapter 11, 15 and following, does not specifically mention the destruction of heaven and earth. However, what we did see is that Revelation 11 and Revelation chapter 20 are absolutely, perfectly parallel with one another. They speak of the same time and the same event. Revelation 11, time of the resurrection, time of the judgment, time of the kingdom. Revelation chapter 20, resurrection, judgment, kingdom. Let me read again for you the comment by Gregory Beale. I'll, I'll abbreviate the quote. Our overall analysis of Revelation chapter 11, 15 to 19 argues that the hymn speaks of the consummated form of the kingdom. The, stri the striking parallel noted below between Revelation 11, 18 and following and chapter 20, 12 to 13 suggests strongly that this is the case. The consummate nature of the kingdom is also indicated by the greater emphasis on God's reign rather than on Christ. Now, what Beale is saying is, in simple form, Revelation 11 is directly parallel to Revelation chapter 20. So, here's the argument that I closed with in our previous lesson. Since Revelation chapter 11 equals Revelation 20, that means that Revelation 11 is describing the end of the millennium. But since Revelation 20 posits the destruction of heaven and earth at the end of the millennium, and Revelation 11 is directly parallel with Revelation 20, that means that Revelation chapter 11, even though it does not use the term or the terminology of the destruction of heaven and earth, it's nonetheless talking about that. We have also seen that Revelation 11 takes place at the judgment of the city where the Lord was crucified. I, I don't know how anyone could deny that. And so, therefore, that means that the end of the millennium, the resurrection, the judgment, the kingdom, all came to fruition at the time of the judgment of Babylon. Now, listen, some former preterists have become really, really fond of inserting humongous temporal gaps into the biblical text where there is no indication whatsoever of any temporal gap. For instance, Sam Frost goes to Daniel chapter 11, verse 1, and says, well, Daniel, excuse me, Daniel 12, verse 1, where it says, at that time there should be great tribulation, that refers to the time of, of Antiochus Epiphanes. But verse 2, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall arise, that's the resurrection at the end of time. So in other words, Mr. Frost inserts a gap of so far 2,500 years between Daniel 12, 1 and Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. So what does he do in, Daniel, in Revelation chapter 11? Well, Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, may indeed be speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Oh, but wait a minute. It's not just Jerusalem. He now takes the position that, that the great city where the Lord was crucified is also an allusion to other cities guilty of the same crimes, that Babylon is a, is a reference to a composite city, not just Jerusalem. Now, I'll say this as kindly as possible. There's not a shred of evidence to support that, not a syllable of evidence. That is a contrived, invented theological argument without any merit whatsoever. So let me say again, there is not a hint of a clue of a suggestion of an idea that there is a gap between the judgment of the great city in Revelation 11 and the judgment of Revelation 11:15 15 and following. That means that the resurrection of Revelation 11:15 15 at the judgment of the city 
is the resurrection of Revelation chapter 20, which is at the destruction of heaven and earth at the end of the millennium. But since the judgment of Revelation 11 is the judgment of the great city where the Lord was slain, this means that the judgment and the resurrection of Revelation 11:15 occurred at the end of the millennium, as I just suggested, and that in turn means that, quote, heaven and earth passed away at the judgment of the city where the Lord was slain. Now, this is vindicated, this is confirmed, if you please, no, no pun intended, by the fact that the judgment and res re resurrection of Revelation 11 is the time of the vindication of the martyrs, just as in Revelation chapter 20. It is the vindication of the martyrs. Revelation 11, the time of the dead that they should be judged, the time that you should reward your prophets and the saints. Revelation chapter 20 is the time of the vindication of the martyrs <clears throat> who had been given thrones and they waited for the millennium until the judgment of Satan, their great persecutor. So, once again, this identity, this perfect conflation is confirmed by the fact that the judgment and, re and resurrection of Revelation 11 is the time of the vindication of the martyrs, as in chapter 20. Thus, unless one can prove irrefutably that this vindication of the martyrs in chapter 11 and chapter 20, which, by the way, John was told was at hand, coming shortly, coming soon, without delay. Now, unless you can divorce Revelation chapter 11, oh, and by the way, Revelation 16, and oh, by the way, chapter 17 and 18, and chapter 20, from the promise of the vindication of all of the blood of all the righteous shed on the earth from righteous Abel on forward, unless you can delineate between the promise of the vindication of the martyrs at the, end of the, at the end of the millennium at the destruction of heaven and earth from the promise of the vindication of the martyrs in the judgment of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, then what? guess what that proves, folks? It means that the end of the millennium and the passing of heaven and earth occurred in A.D. 70. So, here's what we have seen from Revelation 11, 16, and 20. We have seen that there is one harmonious, consistent narrative concerning the passing of creation. It's not many stories. It's not many judgments. It's not many different times for the vindication of the martyrs. It is not many resurrections. But, you know, if you take the book as sequential, you have to have all these resurrections. You have to have all these judgments. You have to have all these great days of the Lord. And even if you take it as recapitulatory, that is the book Revelation, it, it, it still presents insurmountable difficulty because you've got to divorce the book Revelation and its promise of the vindication of the saints from Jesus' paradigmatic teaching in Matthew chapter 23. And that can't be done. So what we have seen is that this narrative is repeated throughout the book until that climactic great white throne judgment which is the final scene of what had already been depicted repeatedly. Chapter 11, chapter 15, 16, 17, and 18. So we have seen that Revelation 11, 16, and 20 specifically posits the passing of heaven and earth at the judgment of Babylon, the great harlot city, quote, where the Lord was slain. And we have seen that Jesus by the way, not to mention Paul and the other New Testament writers who concur, undeniably posited vindication of all of the blood of all the righteous at the A.D. 70 judgment of Jerusalem. So I believe that we can safely say that we have proven with very careful exegesis, with emphatic statements of Scripture, that heaven and earth passed away, the end of the millennium arrived, and the judgment of the great harlot city in A.D. 70. Now, Let's drive this home by going to another key text that talks about the destruction of heaven and earth, and that's Revelation chapter 6. Now remember, we started at chapter 20, 
The reason I started at chapter 20 was because no one denies that Revelation 20 posits the destruction of heaven and earth at the end of the millennium. But guess what? Revelation 6 likewise talks about the destruction of heaven and earth. It does not specifically mention the passing of the millennium, but it talks about the passing of heaven and earth. So, once again, are we talking about, in chapter 6, are we talking about a different passing of heaven and earth from the passing of heaven and earth in Revelation 20? Are we talking about a different day of the Lord in Revelation 6 from the great day of the Lord in Revelation 20? Are we talking about a different vindication of the martyrs in Revelation 6 from the vindication of the martyrs in Revelation 20? No, we are not. What we find in Revelation chapter 6 is that just in as exactly as we find in chapter 16 and 20, we find the destruction of creation at the great day of the Lord. What is so significant about this is that it can be proven, I believe, with virtual certainty that Revelation 6 is a prediction of the judgment of Jerusalem in AD 70 through some intertextual uh, examinations, which we're about to get into, and i got to hurry here. I believe that identification is absolutely firm. So, if Revelation 6, listen to me, if Revelation 6 is the same time and same event as Revelation 11, if it's the same time and event as Revelation 15, 16, and 20, at the destruction of creation at the end of the millennium, then that means that if Revelation 6 was fulfilled in A.D. 70, then the millennium ended in A.D. 70. So, let's start an examination of Revelation chapter 6. John said, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Now, what are they wanting? They're wanting blood for blood. Lex talionis, just like in chapter 16. Anyway, then... A white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them they should rest a little while longer. Notice he doesn't say for a couple of thousand years. Anyway, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, should be completed, filled up to the measure. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, just as in chapter 16. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. That's chapter 16, 19 and following. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. Who is able to stand? Now look, folks, I really believe that this passage is, in fact, paradigmatic for the rest of the apocalypse. Now, I very well could have started here in my very first lesson. But again, the reason I didn't start here is because we don't find a specific reference to the end of the millennium in Revelation chapter 6. We do in chapter 20, and therefore that's why I chose to start with chapter 20 and the universally admitted reality that Revelation 20 posits the destruction of heaven and earth at the end of the millennium. Now, there are several things to be noted about Revelation chapter 6. Number one, <clears throat> it is the destruction of creation, verse 12 and following. Number two, it draws directly 
from the language of Old Testament prophecies of historical days of the Lord. Those days were never end of time events. The language used was always metaphoric. The, and by the way, you can see my book, Who is This Babylon, for a full demonstration of this. The language that, that John uses in, in Revelation chapter 6 comes directly from Isaiah chapter 34 and other prophecies, of course. But Isaiah 34 specifically, the, you know, the sky be rolled up as a scroll. Well, that was a prophecy of the destruction of Edom at the great day of God's wrath. When heaven and earth would be destroyed. Well, guess what? In Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and following, Malachi looks back on the destruction of Edom as an accomplished, fulfilled reality. Now, since Isaiah 34 predicted the destruction of heaven and earth at the great day of God's wrath, but Malachi chapter 1, 2 and following looks back on the destruction of Edom as an accomplished reality, then that means, guess what? It means heaven and earth passed away at the destruction of Edom at the great day of God's wrath. Edom was destroyed in approximately 583 B.C. by the Babylonians. So, this language of Revelation chapter 6 is taken directly from Old Covenant prophecies that predicted historical events, God, pardon me, sovereignly acting to use one nation to destroy another language. This proves the language is metaphoric. Number three, the language of this day precludes any reference to an end of time event that is, that is over, quote, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now look, if men could run to the hills, hide in the rocks and the caves, then clearly that day is not over in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Right? I mean, <laughs> in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, how does anybody have time to run to the hills, hide in the caves, call to the rocks, fall on us, hide us? Number four, this language is taken directly from times of invasion. That is, this, this language of running to the hills, hiding in the rocks and the caves, is taken directly from the Old Testament passages that talked about the invasion, a time of invasion in which men would flee from the invading armies. In Judges chapter 6, 1 to 3, the Midianites invaded Israel, wreaking havoc on the nation. The inhabitants of the, flan, uh, of the land fled to the mountains and hid in the, in the caves and called to the rocks, fall on us. Likewise, in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and 6, when the Philistines were just about to invade Israel, quote, when the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were greatly distressed, then the people hid in the caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits, unquote. You see, John is drawing on the normal, regular somewhat apocalyptic, but nonetheless, language of a time of invasion. It's not having anything whatsoever to do with an end of time. So the point here is that the language of fleeing to the hills and hiding in the rocks and the caves was typ typical Hebraic expressions for what happened in times of warfare. And by the way, our next point will drive that home. Now, Revelation chapter 6 quotes verbatim from Isaiah chapter 2, 9 to 11, Isaiah 2, 19 to 21. Let me read that for you. They shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth from the terror of the Lord and from the glory of His majesty. By the way, Paul quotes this verse verbatim, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Hang on to that fact. When he arises, when the Lord arises, to shake the earth mightily. Does this sound like a judgment of the heaven and earth, or at least the earth? Sure it does. In that day, which is the day of the Lord, 
A man will cast away his, uh, his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made, each one uh, for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the crags of the rugged rocks from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. Now, I want you to notice something. This is so cool, and it is so incredibly powerful. As Jesus was being led out to his death, to his crucifixion, Luke chapter 23, 28 and following records the following. following. Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed, the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore and breasts which never nurse. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things, in the greenwood, what will be done in the dry? Recognize that? Well, of course you do. It's taken from Isaiah 2. Oh, and by the way, the parallel of Hosea chapter 10. Now, listen to me. Very, very few commentators. I've only found one or two, and, and they so, uh, I call it sermonizing. They completely detach their comments from any kind of historical context and just turn the passage into something that uh, has no application at all for those people at that time. So, very few commentators deny that Jesus was predicting the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of the Romans. So here's what we have. We have Jesus quoting from Isaiah chapter 2, Jesus, uh, excuse me, Isaiah's prediction of the day of the Lord when the Lord would rise to shake the earth mightily when men would run to the hills. And by the way, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, puts that day, that day of the Lord, in the last days. So we have the great day of the Lord when men would run to the hills and hide in the rocks. Well, wait a minute. We're supposedly in the last days now. We're supposedly waiting for the day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord that we're waiting on is supposed to be over in the twinkling of an eye. Does it work, does it? Now, watch this. Catch the power of this. Here we have Isaiah predicting the last day's day of the Lord, when the Lord would rise to shake the earth mightily, when men would run to the hills, call on the rocks to fall on them. Jesus quoted those verses in Luke chapter 23 and applied it to A.D. 70. Now, in Revelation chapter 6, John quotes from the same identical verses that Jesus applied to A.D. 70. So, if Jesus quoted from Isaiah's prediction of the great day of the Lord, the time of the destruction of creation, and applied it to A.D. 70, and if John, and again, Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and John quoted from those same identical verses, what is our authority, what is our hermeneutic for claiming that in Revelation 6, John was applying Isaiah 2 to some other event radically different in time and nature from how Jesus applied Isaiah. Now, I would make this observation very, very quickly. Not only did Isaiah predict the great day of the Lord, when the Lord would rise to shake the earth mightily, when men would run to the rocks and the hills, and the caves, but it would also be the time of the avenging of the blood of the martyrs, Isaiah chapter 4, verse 4. So in Revelation chapter 6, we have the prediction of the great day of the Lord at the destruction of creation, when the Lord would fulfill Isaiah chapter 2, when men would run to the rocks and the hills at the time of the vindication of the martyrs. Now remember, Jesus applied Isaiah to A.D. 70. Where is the authority for saying John was speaking of a totally separate and disparate event? Now, in Revelation chapter 6, John also quotes from Malachi chapter 3. He not only quotes from Isaiah chapter 2 and 4, he quotes from Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3 described the great day of God's wrath, and said, Who shall stand before him? Now listen to me. Just like the language of running to the hills, this language 
is taken from Old Testament predictions of historical days of the Lord in judgment of cities and nations. For instance, in Nahum, chapter 1, 1 to 6, the judgment of, of Nineveh, who shall be able to stand before him? See, this is typical Hebraic language. So, John, in Revelation chapter 6, quotes from Malachi chapter 3, 1 to 3, which was a prediction of the coming of the Lord in judgment of the old covenant temple. And the Lord whom you shall seek shall come suddenly to his temple, and who shall stand in the day of his coming. That word coming there is from the Hebrew bowl, and it means coming in judgment. So the significance of these correlations cannot be overemphasized. Malachi chapter 3 is a prediction of the coming destruction of the Jerusalem temple. By the way, Malachi is written long after the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. So let's look a little closer at Revelation 6 and Malachi chapter 3. In Malachi chapter 3, the messenger of that text would herald the coming of the Lord in judgment when no man could stand before him. John the baptizer was that messenger. Mark chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. He's qu he quotes from Malachi 3. And he applies it to John. So Mark identifies John the baptizer as the messenger who would come warning of the coming of the day of the Lord against Jerusalem. Not only that, that judgment that was coming at the great day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord to his temple in judgment, was to be a judgment of Israel for violating Torah in Malachi chapter 3, 5 and following, the Lord said that Israel was guilty of mistreating the orphans, the widows, of refusing the pagans or the Gentiles their place in the kingdom. They, they allowed sorcerers and adulterers. What you have to understand is that every item listed in Malachi chapter 3, 5 to following is taken directly from Torah in Exodus 22, 18 to 24, and Deuteronomy chapter 27, 19 and following. Those specific, I mean verbatim sins are iterated, and the Lord said, because you, it, when you do these things, I will bring the sword of judgment upon you. You shall die by the edge of the sword. This is covenantal judgment. So John was the messenger of Malachi chapter 3 to warn of the coming of the day of the Lord against the temple when no man could stand before him the time when God would judge Israel for violating Torah. Once again, John as the messenger was the fulfillment of Malachi chapter 3. Well, what did John say about that coming judgment in fulfillment of Malachi chapter 3? John said it was imminent. John said, Who warned you, the, speaking of the Pharisees and Sadducees, who warned you to flee from the wrath that is about to come? His axe is already at the root. <clears throat> his winnowing fork is already in his hand. Now, folks, what this means is that John was warning Israel of the imminent coming national judgment on Israel. John, as the messenger, was not predicting a judgment at the end of time. Now, since John, in Revelation 6, is quoting Malachi chapter 3, but Malachi chapter 3 foretold the day of the Lord in national judgment of Israel, then that means that the great day of the Lord in fulfillment 
of Malachi chapter 3, quoted in Revelation 6, would be the time of the national judgment of Israel. Oh, but that's not all. John was also, in addition to being the messenger, and you ought to get my book, Elijah Has Come, a solution to Romans 11, 25 to 27. John was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. John was the messenger, and John was Elijah. So, Elijah would come, listen to me carefully, Chapter 3, 5, and 6, judgment for violating Torah. Covenantal judgment was coming at the great day of the Lord, when the Lord would come suddenly to His temple, when no man could stand before Him. Then Elijah would come, calling on Israel, remember the law of Moses, my servant. What's he doing? He's echoing chapter 3, 5, and 6, uh, 5 and following, where they were in violation of Torah. And because they were in violation of Torah, Malachi would come calling them back to observance of Torah and warning them that if they didn't, the great day of the Lord would come. Now listen, as Elijah, John warned of the judgment, as we've already seen, that was about to come, Matthew 3, verse 7. The axe was already at the root. Now, folks, listen. I've cut a little bit of wood in my, in my time, cut down several trees in my time. And I've never known of a situation in which I've already got the axe laid at the root in which I wasn't just about to cut that thing down. This is powerful language of eminence, just as the statement, his winnowing fork is already in his hand. Context of judgment, context of harvest. So, if John as the messenger and if John as Elijah foretold the great day of the Lord in Revelation 6, which is the time of the destruction of heaven and earth, okay, that means that the day of the Lord of Revelation, excuse me, Malachi chapter 3, which is the great day of the Lord of Revelation 6, but the great day of the Lord of Revelation 6 is the time of the destruction of heaven and earth. That means that the coming of the Lord of Malachi chapter 3 is the time of the destruction of heaven and earth. But that means it's the end of the millennium of Revelation chapter 20. Likewise, the coming of Elijah to foretell the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, judgment on Israel for violating Torah. But that judgment was near when John wrote and if that great day of the Lord is the great day of the Lord of Revelation 20, then it's the time of the destruction of heaven and earth. And that means that Revelation 6 clearly is the time of the destruction of heaven and earth. And, as we have shown, Revelation, excuse me, Malachi chapter 3 was the prediction of the time of national judgment on Israel. It has nothing to do with an end of time. Okay, we've got to, got to move on. So the correlation between Revelation 6, 11, and 16 and the identity of Babylon as the persecutor being Old Covenant Jerusalem means that the destruction of heaven and earth in vindication of the martyrs was to be in AD 70. Remember, Jesus emphatically posited the time of the vindication of all of the martyrs for his generation. Matthew 23, Luke chapter 18. Paul did likewise, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. So, once again, unless one can absolutely positively divorce Jesus' paradigmatic teaching on the time and the context for the vindication of the martyrs, this is a controlling factor in our understanding and application of Revelation. Listen, I, I would strongly urge you to get a copy of Sam Dawson's fantastic book on the vindication of all of the blood. It is in the virtual uh, Preterist Pilgrim Weekend virtual bookstore. It's absolutely great. All right? So, when we examine Revelation 6 in light of all of these facts, there are other elements in chapter 6 that we don't have time to touch on, by the way. Then the evidence mounts up and it becomes insurmountable. Revelation is the great day of God's wrath on the persecutors of the Lord's saints. Well, in Revelation chapter 20, it is the great day of the Lord against Satan, the great persecutor. That great day, great day would be in fulfillment of Jesus' prediction of Matthew 23. That was in A.D. 70. 
it would be in fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 2, 19 to 21, which according to Jesus in Luke 23, 28 and following, was in AD 70. It would be in fulfillment of, of Malachi chapter 3. This means it would be in the fulfillment of the ministry of John the baptizer, and John posited the fulfillment of his message imminently. It would also be the fulfillment of the promise of the coming of Elijah in Malachi chapter 4. Once again, John said fulfillment of his message was coming soon. So based on all of these facts, since the great day of the Lord in Revelation was to be in A.D. 70, since the creation, since the destruction of creation was to be at that great day of the Lord, and since the creation would be destroyed at the end of the millennium, this means without any doubt whatsoever that the millennium ended in A.D. 70. Now very quickly, let's summarize what we have seen in chapter 6. Revelation 6 cites Isaiah 2, which foretold the day of the Lord, when the Lord would shake the earth mightily. Revelation cites that prophecy along with the language from other day of the Lord prophecies, such as Isaiah 34, prophecies that are demonstrably metaphoric, which predicted the day of the Lord and the destruction of creation, but never the literal destruction of literal creation. We thus have John predicting the day of the Lord's wrath for the vindication of the martyrs that Jesus said would occur in the judgment of Jerusalem. We have John citing Isaiah 2 and the very verses that Jesus applied to A.D. 70. And remember, Isaiah 4.4 4 puts that vindication of the martyrs also at the point of the destruction of Jerusalem. We have, we have John quoting the metaphoric language of the day of the Lord against Edom. Now, this is the great day of the Lord's wrath, which is to be conflated with Revelation 11, 16, and 20. Unless you want to say we have at least four different great days of the Lord and at least three, perhaps four, destructions of heaven and earth. But the great day of the Lord's wrath in Revelation chapter 6 is for the vindication of the martyrs. Just like... The great day of the Lord's wrath in Revelation 11, Revelation 16, 18, and 20 is the time of the vindication of the slain prophets. But folks, remember, this is the time of the destruction of creation. Since the great day of the Lord in Revelation 6, 12 is the answer to the prayer of the martyrs for vindication, which, which would come after they received their robes, after they were enthroned, then since the vindication occurs at the end of the millennium, after they receive robes and crowns. So since the vindication occurs at the end of, end of the millennium in Revelation 20, that means that the great day of the Lord and the destruction of heaven and earth in Revelation 6, Revelation 11, Revelation 16, likewise occurs at the end of the millennium. Since, therefore, the vindication would be at the judgment of Babylon, O covenant Jerusalem, this proves that the end of the millennium was in A.D. 70. Now, I would really, really, really like to discuss Matthew 24 and 25, especially Matthew 24, 29 and following, but I don't have time. So let's see what we have established. We have shown that the destruction of heaven and earth is posited at the end of the millennium. That is undeniable. We have shown that the destruction of creation is likewise, likewise posited at the judgment of Babylon, Revelation 16, the city guilty of shedding the blood of the martyrs. That means that Babylon in Revelation was Old Covenant Jerusalem. Therefore, the destruction of creation would come at the time of the judgment of Babylon at the end of the millennium. So it matters not if one takes the recapitulatory or the sequential view of Revelation. If you take the sequential view, then heaven and earth is to be destroyed at least three times, maybe more. If recapitulatory, one must deal with the issues, number one, of the time of the fulfillment of Isaiah chapters 2 through 4 and the fulfillment of Malachi chapter 3. You must deal with the, uh, with the motif of the vindication of the martyrs, which Jesus put at A.D. 70. And you must see that the, that the vindication of the martyrs in Revelation chapter 20 comes at the end of the millennium. But again, let me reemphasize, the vindication of the martyrs at the judgment of, and destruction of Babylon, and Babylon was old covenant Jerusalem. 
So to conclude, Revelation presents a consistent and unified doctrine of the destruction of heaven and earth. That destruction would occur at the end of the millennium. That destruction would occur when the martyrs would be vindicated at the great day of the Lord in judgment and resurrection. And that destruction would occur, or that resurrection would occur, in the judgment of Babylon. We have in Revelation the fulfillment of Matthew 5, 17 and 18, until heaven and earth passes away, not one jot, not one tittle of the law shall pass from the law until it is all fulfilled. And Jesus said that in the destruction of Jerusalem, quote, these be the days of vengeance in which all things that are written must be fulfilled. So, since Babylon of Revelation was Old Covenant Jerusalem, we have, ha we have definitive evidence to prove that heaven and earth passed away in A.D. 70 at the end of the millennium. Thanks so much. Well, I hope you enjoyed that third and last presentation on the destruction of creation and the end of the millennium. Listen, uh, there's so much more in the book of Revelation that proves, at least in my mind, that the, that the millennium ended in the first century. And Lord willing, one of these days, if the Lord grants me enough time, I'm going to put together a book that will be a uh, well, it won't be based on Joseph Vincent's book, but it will carry it a step further, and it, it will discuss the themes that I have presented to you here in Preterist Pilgrim Weekend 2020. It will also develop a lot of other themes, you know, like the great day of the Lord and the end of the millennium. A topic also that we have touched on extensively here, and that is the vindication of the martyrs at the end of the millennium. The wedding of the bridegroom at the destruction of Babylon, the great persecutor, at the end of the millennium. As you can see, there's an awful lot, awful lot of material, and this doesn't even begin to touch the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies concerning the coming of the new creation at the end of the millennium, and when that is posited for us uh, in Scripture. So, you know, Lord willing, one of these days, uh, again, if I'm granted the time by the Lord, if I live long enough, uh, I hope to be able to produce a book on the end of the millennium. Well, anyway, we are out of time. This has certainly been a unique Preterist Pilgrim weekend, to say the very least. This COVID-19 situation has disrupted all of our lives. Uh, and, and let me say, we just hope and we pray that you are safe and healthy. And we urge you, please continue constant in prayer. Please continue to observe the proper protocols for safety. Uh, it's very, very important. So, uh, I want to begin with, or I want to close out this uh, Preterist Pilgrim Weekend 2020 with a few comments here. First of all, I want to express my profound appreciation for Alan Morton, my webmaster, for putting together all of the videos in the format that has been presented for your enjoyment. Look, I want, uh, look, I, I did all the introductions. I filmed my own lessons and what have you. My voice is paid for it. But the bottom line is, Alan has done a tremendous amount of, quote, behind the scenes work in gathering all of these videos, organizing them, making sure they fit where they're supposed to fit and you know occasionally having to email me and say hey Don you did this and you didn't do that and I need this and I need that <laughs> uh, yeah so anyway uh, I, I just cannot express enough my appreciation to Alan Morton my webmaster uh, Alan's been doing my websites for a few years now I cannot tell you how much I appreciate him and the fantastic job that he does in organizing and, and designing and doing all of that work that I literally don't have a clue how to do. So again, my sincere thanks to Alan Morton. I clearly want to thank all of the speakers who have spoken for us uh, this year. Uh, we do appreciate their work. Daniel Rogers, Scott Fisher, uh, John Watson, William Bell, uh, you know, 
had some new speakers for you. We try to we try to have at least one new speaker every year, and yet because of popular demand, as it were, uh, we try to have some of the old favorites also. I made mention of the fact, you know, that William Bell has been on virtually every single Predators Pilgrim weekend. Came close a couple of times not being able to be here. And I suspect, that, I suspect that one of these days he won't be able to make it. I don't know, I, you know, don't know what the future holds. But obviously, we want him here because he does such a fantastic job. I know that you join with me in expressing your appreciation. And, you know, in the comment section, <clears throat> feel free to express your appreciation to Alan Morton and to the speakers. Now, normally... We have a long list of people that I have to thank. Uh, we, we normally have Jim and Sharon Wade, who takes care of our book table. Uh, guess what? Alan Morton took care of that. But we certainly appreciate Jim and Sharon's work in the past, and we appreciate their fr friendship so very, very much. Rod and Connie Rupert, who also, uh, I mean, they just do everything. And they haven't been able or needed to participate in this video uh, Preterist Pilgrim Weekend. Nonetheless, we appreciate so much their friendship and their help in the past. Uh, you know, I, I've always expressed my appreciation to Martha Pryor, who has served as a gopher and someone who just does anything and everything that needs to be done. Well, once again, not this year. And also, my wife, you know, my wife and I were talking just the other day about, wow, what a change. And, you know, the, the stress that she is always under uh, to get all of the logistics that I don't ever have to worry about. <laughs> Thankfully, you know, the meals, the catering, uh, uh, everything. And we were talking about what, a, what an incredible relief it is that she hasn't had to do that. Now, that doesn't mean she doesn't like doing it, Okay. I got to tell you, we love bringing you Preterist Pilgrim Weekend. We really do. And it is such a blessing to us. We know that it is a blessing to you because of the feedback that we get. So, I just want to express appreciation to anyone and to everyone that has had a, had a part in bringing you the Preterist Pilgrim Weekend 2020. I want to close with a final word. This COVID-19 has been very difficult, as I mentioned, for an awful lot of you. It has been very, very difficult for a lot of our financial supporters. I will share with you that we have lost several hundred dollars a month in monthly support. That cannot continue. And therefore, I'm going to appeal to you, those of you who, uh, who have taken advantage of watching the Preterist Pilgrim Weekend for free of charge. We haven't charged anything whatsoever. And by the way, yes, we're going to give each one of our speakers an honorarium. But you know what? We need your help. We need your help with one-time contributions. We need your help, guess what, on monthly support. Because as I mentioned, we've lost several hundred dollars a month as a result of people's uh, losing their jobs as a result of people's income being dramatically uh, decreased. And, you know, we fully understand that. Believe me, we do. But that doesn't lessen the stress that it puts on Preterist Pilgrim, uh, or, you know, PRI, Preterist Research Institute. So I'm going to ask that you please, if you can help us with a one-time contribution to help pay uh, for our regular operating expenses, as well as bringing you the, uh, this weekend. If you can help us monthly, we need monthly support, and we need it badly. I hate to close Predators Pilgrim Weekend 2020 uh, on that kind of an appeal, but folks, uh, as I've told you many, many times, I don't like asking for money, all right? I just don't like doing it. But the reality is, as you know, it takes money to get along in this world. It takes money to do what we do for you. So again, I ask you to please consider supporting Preterist Research Institute in any way that you can. All right, well, here we are. We are at the close of Preterist Pilgrim Weekend 2020. I trust, I hope, and I pray 
that all of these lessons would have given you greater insight, greater ability to understand the marvelous book that we call Revelation. Thanks again so much for joining us. Hope to see you next year at the Ardmore Convention Center. God bless.